Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. I would like to invite the scouts and leader of Scout Troop 1485 of Hereford to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and thank you to Scout Troop 1485 who are here tonight to fulfill our requirement for their citizenship in the community merit badge, so thank you. Yeah. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast through the Peace BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the February 28th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I think there is. Yes. You don't have any, though. But no, um, is there any board members that have an addition to the agenda? Yes, I do. <laughs> Let me just second. Um, go ahead, board member Pumphrey. You can just say it. We'll okay, sorry about that. I'd like to add to the agenda um, the executive search committee contract. New business contract award? Yes, please. Okay, may, board members, may I have a motion to add new business contract award to the agenda as letter H? So moved, Ken. Thank you. May I have a second? Second, Dominowski. Thank you. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is 10. Okay, the motion passes. The revised agenda is approved and the agenda stands. Is approved. Early this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matters that affects one or more specific individuals, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented exhibits D1 through D3? So moved, oh, so moved, Hassan. Thank you, do I have a second? Second, Hager. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. 
Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board, I am bringing forward <clears throat> excuse me, the following administrative appointments for your approval. Senior Business Systems Software Engineer in the Office of Technology Solutions Support, Principal of Rosedale Alternative High School, Supervisor of Related Services, Department of Special Education, and Senior Auditor in the Office of Internal Audit. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Hassan. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Second was Dr. Savoy. Any discussion? <coughs> May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Dr. Williams? Sure, thank you. Our first appointment is Joseph Kopik III as the principal of Rosedale Alternative High School. Please stand. Joining him is his wife, Carly Kopik. Uh, Joseph, yep. <laughs> Joseph Kopik III brings over 17 years of experience in Baltimore County, and his most recent position was an assistant principal at Newtown High School. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Richard E. Brown, who is watching virtually. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. He brings over 30 years of service, and his most recent position was a senior member of the technical staff of SAP Financial Verizon Communications. He's being promoted as the senior business system software engineer in the Office of Technology Solutions Support. Congratulations. Next, we have our new supervisor of related services in the Department of Special Education. That is John Lichner, who is watching virtually. He brings 23 years of service as a classroom teacher, and his most recent position was a teacher elementary classroom at Millbrook Elementary School. Congratulations, John Lichner. And our last appointment is the senior auditor in the internal audit. We have Ashley Smith. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. Ashley Smith, who is watching virtually, brings over 15 years of experience, and her previous position was an auditor at the Defense Contract Audit Agency, operates under the Secretary of Defense. So congratulations, and welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations to everyone. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. Online registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. No speaker substitutions will be allowed. For those who were not selected through the online registration, a wait list sign-up sheet was available 30 minutes prior to the meeting. If a registered speaker is absent, speaker slots will be reassigned from the wait list so that the 10 speaker slots are allocated. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and to this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personnel remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt 
or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that your time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I will now call on, on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Elisa Alonzo from Central AEAC. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Lichter, members of the Board of Education and Superintendent Williams. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate the new members. I wish you all the best of luck as you work hard to improve the, our public schools. I'm the first year chair of the CAEAC. We're a volunteer group that tries to support BCPS through reaching out to our communities and helping arrange meetings where community members have the opportunity to hear from education experts and BCPS staff and to ask, ask questions and provide comments on various topics. This year, the AEACs have held discussions about special pro education programs, nutrition, volunteer opportunities, and the BCPS budget, among other things. We reach out to the BCPS schools and the PTAs to let them know that, we are, that all are welcome to join any of our meetings. I hope that anyone who is listening here today um, and his, who is interested in what we do will reach out to us to come participate in our future meetings. Our next meeting will be held Wednesday, March 2nd. This is for the central area. And we will be, dis we will be discussing school capacity and class, study and class sizes. Um, various schools in the central area have had overcapacity issues over the past few years, and in particular, parents at Hampton Elementary have reached out to me to tell me about their cur current situation that is particularly egregious. Class sizes have approached 30 students at some elementary schools, and special education needs have not uniformly been met. I know from personal experience and seeing my kids how much they benefit from smaller class sizes and from more hands-on personal attention from their teachers. I've also had my kids attend class in trailers due to overcapacity, and I've seen some of the challenging issues that large class sizes bring, such as with student behavior. I truly hope that our March meeting will be well attended so that we can have a part productive conversation about how to provide students with better learning environments and teachers with a better teaching environment. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton from TABCO. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Hundreds of educators were here tonight standing up for a compensation package that shows respect. Respect that other counties are showing their educators. Respect that looks like a raise to help mitigate the costs of inflation. Yes, you all know my message of recruiting and retaining educators, and we at BCPS unfortunately still are not doing this well. The salary compression, which will increase our educators' career earnings, is one way to show that respect, a tangible way that will help us to keep the educators our students need. And I'm going to take a new angle tonight. Since telling uh, everyone how we address the academic, social, emotional, physical, and mental health needs of our students hasn't done it yet. So when two of my own children were in Perry Hall High some 11 and 13 years ago, there was a student who wowed everyone in the school place. We knew Shireen Ahmed was going places, and she did, to Broadway, as the first woman of color to play Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady. Shireen's music teachers knew her talent and provided opportunities for her and many other students in plays in elementary, middle, and high school. Teachers helped cultivate that love. I had the privilege of seeing two BCPS high school plays this month. At Carver, the show was Fame, and at Perry Hall, it was Fiddler on the Roof. I went to both to see two of my former students starring, and the shows were amazing. All the actors did a great job. Perry Hall, as always, had a live pit providing the music. 
But the showstopper for me was the student who played the English teacher in Fame, and she sang the song, These Are My Children. It brought me to tears, and I will spare you my nice singing. But the refrain is, these are my children, my saving grace. I see my calling in every face. These are my children, and I thank God for choosing me. We really are called to teach. Our students are our children, and it is a privilege to teach them. Teachers sow those seeds of acting and singing and playing musical instruments and make this happen. We do this for our students because we love them and we love what they do. Teachers put in countless extra hours preparing students for these events. And we need to have those events and clubs and sports and all those other things that happen after the instructional day is over. But if we keep losing our educators, we're also going to lose those opportunities. We're tired. We love the work, but we're tired of fighting for compensation that is equal to others around us. We're not asking to be top in the state in compensation, although that would be nice, but we don't want to be in the middle of the pack anymore. Other school systems are doing it. Our students need us. Our pleas for appropriate compensation, we need you to be listening, advocating for our students as we are, supporting our students by being sure they have those educators they need. Let's finish negotiations for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joe Coughlin from ESPBC. Good evening. Good evening, board members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I am Joseph Coughlin, the Vice President of the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. I am coming to you today on behalf of the 2100 paraeducators, technicians, yeah office professionals and health assistants dedicated to the education in Baltimore, to, dedicated to education in Baltimore County Public Schools. You've heard me and our union president, Jeanette Young, speak about the partnership we have had over the last few years as we work to address the needs of, of the educati education, education support professionals in Baltimore County. Today, I come to you asking that you continue that collaborative effort by reaching a wage package that will benefit all members of our bargaining unit. During this legislative session in Annapolis, Governor Moore has proposed a raise, to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour this year. This is a 13%, over 13% increase. Even if that doesn't pass, the minimum wage is set for $14 on January 1st, and that'll be a 6% increase. This will cut the buying power of everyone, especially our members who are not getting a living wage. I understand the budget and negotiation process. The amount, of, the, the amount currently included in the superintendent's proposed budget would leave over a third of, the bargaining un, of our bargaining unit members, that is 828 BCPS employees, without any wage increase next year. Our members, our members not recognized in the current proposed budget would not be able to maintain their current financial obligations because they will be making less money than they made last year. That's right. The buying power for our members will decrease again this year. This is no way to show the respect to the, middle, the most senior dedicated employees of Baltimore County Public Schools. I know you heard us outside a short while ago. 300 educators came to show their collective concern and frustration about the priority of staff in the current proposed budget. We, the employees, are the most valuable resource BCPS has, and our value needs to be reflected in the budget. I challenge you to deliver a meaningful compensation package for all ESPBC unit members. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maylee Anderson from AFSCME. Good evening. Good evening. I apologize for my voice. I'm so sorry. Okay. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. To our newest board members, I would like to extend a warm welcome. My name is Malia Anderson, and I'm a school bus attendant for the last 12 years. I'm here with uh, permission and on behalf of our president, Brian Epps. As I've stated, I am a bus attendant, and I would first like to take this moment to thank Dr. Yarbrough 
and Dr. Grimm for fixing many of the transportation issues that have lingered at least the last 12 years that I've been here. Transportation is starting to run a lot smoother. Dr. Williams, I would like to thank you so much, not only for your support with helping us with transportation, but just everything that you've done for us for the past three and a half years. Thank you very, very much. But this evening, I'm here to speak about the upcoming budget. I would like to emphasize that AFSCME entry-level entry positions, for example, bus attendants, cafeteria workers, building service workers, and grounds workers represent a large number of our current vacancies. Why? AFSCME is constantly being told that these vacancies are because our people aren't starting at $15 an hour. And let's be honest, even that's not a fair livable wage. We're asking for the board to fund a livable wage for all of our employees, including STEPS, Longevity, and COLA. Please keep in mind that many of the convenience stores and fast food chains are paying more than $15 an hour. And many of our, and many of our children are even making more money than we are. If it's really all about our students, wouldn't it be nice for them to know that the people who are servicing them are being paid a livable wage. I would definitely like to thank you for this opportunity to speak this evening, and I hope our board will do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Samantha Werfel from BS, BCSC. Good evening. Good evening, it's so nice to be here, and it's so great to see some of you again as well. My name is Samantha Warfell, and I'm the current president of the Baltimore County Student Councils and a current senior at Hereford High School. I am so excited to be here tonight to update you regarding several current initiatives of the Baltimore County Student Councils. In March, we look forward to a very busy schedule of all things student advocacy. Our legislative affairs coordinators on our executive board have been hard at work planning an advocacy day with local legislators at the Maryland State House, during which members of the BCSC executive board will advocate for several youth-related bills. We also eagerly anticipate our March General Assembly, which will, host, will virtually host students from across the county as they represent their school-based student councils through participation in an idea sharing session and workshops on topics ranging from setting an example of self-care as a student leader to leveraging technology effectively to captivate their student councils and groups beyond. Further, BCSC is proud to be sending students to represent our region at the Maryland Association of Student Councils annual three-day convention to proudly represent our region once again and network with student leaders from across the state. At the end of March, BCSC will recognize the election of the 43rd student member of the Board of Education. We congratulate this year's candidates, Nick Dimitriadis, Nathan Harris, and Kayla Drummond, by all of whom the students of BCPS would be very well represented next year. Lastly, BCSC is thrilled to announce that we'll be, we will be hosting a walk to honor our former advisor, Mrs. Nora Murray, and benefit the organization Finnish Sarcoma. On April 15th, Ms. Murray's birthday, we will be hosting the event at Hereford High School. The event will feature various student leaders and the organizations and groups they represent to celebrate Ms. Murray's legacy, one that undoubtedly honored and cherished student leaders from across the county. All proceeds will be donated to the Finnish Sarcoma organization. I would also like to thank the countless hours of dedication and steadfast um, organization of the students of BCSC for their continued efforts throughout the school year that make our initiatives like this a possibility. And I thank you all for listening to my updates tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next is general public comments and our first speaker is Sharon Serhoff. Good evening, everyone. My last few meetings have been discussing accountability, and I wanted to let you know that I do not think that this particular board is holding certain people accountable because of what I am seeing in the schoolhouse. 
over the past couple of months, I have attended IEP meetings where parents are bullied, threatened, and in some cases, verbally abused. And who is held accountable? My clients. Because they dare to have an advocate in the room fighting back for them and saying it's not okay to have them treated the way they are treated. The Office of Special Education has noted to several of my clients in writing that they do not collaborate with advocates. I have offered my services to my clients because I have been told by some administrators I make my parents feel accountable and empowered. They know their rights if I'm in the meeting. They have very useful input when I'm in a meeting. But it is not okay for any staff member, including myself, to be threatening, verbally abusive, or bullying at any kind of a meeting. If I'm that way, yes, I should get a consequence. But the person who instigated that particular response should also get a consequence. That's accountability. Collaborative working together is part of accountability. If a parent asks for something like data, like for someone from central office to go in and see what I see, that's accountability. And that's not what I'm seeing in this county. I see it in other counties. I have clients in Anne Arundel and in Howard, for instance. And people are more than willing to go in with me from central office to observations and have me at meetings. We need to be accountable. Our next speaker is Deborah Ford. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Lichter, Dr. Williams, and fellow board members. My name is Debbie Ford, and I've been an office professional with BCPS for 24 years. I am, like many of my other colleagues, work more than their designated hours, including evenings and weekends, without asking for compensation to ensure that things run smoothly and efficiently in our schoolhouses. The ones who continue to go above and beyond handling the increasing workload that has been placed upon us since the pandemic, continuously pivoting with ever-changing rules, policies, and new procedures put in place, all the while showing extreme flexibility, multitasking, and handling multiple projects, school-wide events, and transportation issues, just to name a few. The ones who are the loyal and faithful gatekeepers who remain professional under fire when disgruntled parents call our schools, the ones who de-escalate students, staff, and the community, and finally, being on the front line, the first impression of BCPS. To tell you a little about myself, I have participated in the BCPS Aspiring Leadership Program, as well as several BCPS CCBC cohorts. I received outstanding evaluations from my supervisors for all of my 24 years, and I received citations from the governor, and twice have been awarded Office Professional of the Year awards from different organizations. Now, I told you all of that to tell you this. In 2013, I reached the top of my pay grade and steps for my job classification as Admin Secretary 3. This means that other than a cost of living increase, which every other Baltimore County Public School employee would receive, and the two retention bonuses post-pandemic, I have not received a step increase or a raise since 2013. 
Reaching out to our HR and certification offices, I was told that I would not receive a step increase or a pay raise at any time if I remained in my current position. So other than loving my job and what I do, what incentive is there for me to stay at BCPS? I could easily retire or resign, go to work elsewhere, even work from home, and still collect my pension. I have nothing to lose if I leave BCPS, and I'm not alone, but I love the school system. I know that ESPBC is advocating for a long-term restructured wage scale to increase the compensation for all members, and this would be a step in the right direction. If you want to re retain current employees, you must find a way to provide tangible incentives, place a greater emphasis on the people that make up Team BCPS, and restructure salary scales. When I read the board notes, I become less hopeful seeing the amount of resignations and retirements and thinking about the vast knowledge and balanced experience that BCPS loses every year. So I ask you, what is BCPS willing to do in the future to retain employees like myself? Thank you. Our next speaker is Robin Campbell. Robin Campbell. Thank you for this opportunity to address you tonight. As you know, uh, following a 2020 boundary study conducted by the Ohio-based contractor Cropper GIS, which brought 300 additional students instead of the promised 100, Hampton Elementary School is now operating at 121% of capacity. Many parents were relieved by assurances that BCPS was studying this problem and would make recommendations to resolve it. Yesterday, however, we learned that BCPS officials are planning to place four trailers at the school. If this is their solution, it is unacceptable. I urge you as BCPS's supervisors to authorize an emergency boundary study that permanently resolves this overcrowding prior to the 23-24 school year, perhaps by converting Cromwell Valley Elementary into a community school. It is my larger hope, moreover, that as a newly constituted Board of Education facing the awesome responsibility of recruiting a new superintendent following a decade of declining student performance and demoralization among teachers and staff, you will seek a new superintendent who will prioritize two systemic changes that could help to reverse this dispiriting trends. One, eliminate school overcrowding countywide without resorting to boundary changes, and two, devolve more responsibilities to the system's nine areas. Education fashions come and go, but what does not change is that learning happens when teachers teach. Overcrowded classrooms, too rigid curricula, and burdensome policies undermine this essential formula. The next superintendent should be an outspoken advocate for limits on the pace of residential growth that allows contractors to build and profit without contributing to the county's educational infrastructure. In 2020, an independent government task force found that Baltimore County has some of the state's least effective rules for managing the speed of new development. Yet county officials failed to act on the APFO task force's reasonable recommendations, so the number of classrooms cannot keep up with the pace of new home building. Similarly, Baltimore County's response to state legislation allowing it to place fees on development to support the cost of adding classrooms is riddled with exemptions and loopholes. As I speak, a developer hoping to build 400 housing units in Lutherville is not only claiming that no children will live in the project, but by calling it a transit-oriented development, he is hoping to avoid paying any fees that would help add classrooms that will be needed when flesh and blood children occupying those units start registering for class a few years from now. Instead, BCPS will resort to conducting more boundary studies, which are both profoundly disruptive to students, families, and communities, and also wildly inaccurate because school officials make changes based on old numbers instead of projections that anticipate population growth. I am a volunteer on the Central Northeast Boundary Study. Ugh, there we go. There's a lot to be said. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Peter Baum. Good evening. Good evening. All right. 
Hello, I am Peter Baum. I am an ESOL teacher at Woodlawn High School. And I must say before I begin that my department is one of the most incredible groups of people that I've ever worked with. We have an ethnically diverse team of people where everyone speaks at least two languages on top of our certifications. All of us have advanced degrees and some of us have more than one. The incredible people I work with make the job a little easier, but it is never easy. I choose to work at Woodlawn High School not because it's easy, but I choose to do it for my students. Students who I love and empathize with. Because I too have been a stranger in a strange land and had to face similar struggles when I lived abroad. But now, on to this budget. Dr. Williams in the executive summary states that it focuses on strengthening our course and shaping our future of our school systems by maintaining critical investments in people in progress. But this budget cuts teacher wages. Is the future of Baltimore County one without teachers? How can we be investing in people when the executive summary states that there is a 2% cut to my wages? How can we be investing in people when we are cutting the, very, the wages of the very people who uh, run this institution? 12% of the teachers in the county leave before their third year. Over 600 teachers resigned in the last year alone. Who is replacing them? Teacher, pre teacher prep programs are down 35% in the state of Maryland alone, leaving us with 200 or 329 more vacancies than we have teachers coming in. Uh, so we have, when we have quality, experienced teachers walking out the door, it is often impossible to replace the experience lost. More often than not, they are replaced by long-term subs and brand new teachers, often without qualifications. Teachers are leaving in mass, and why wouldn't they? I could quit my job now and get a $10,000 raise by moving to Howard County, but I don't because this is where I'm needed. This is where I can make a difference. However, at the end of the day, I still have to eat. This is the reality of many teachers in our county. I've had many difficult conversations with coworkers who have to choose between filling their car with gas and getting food at any given week. We are already restricted to a wage that can't even afford us a house in our districts. Adding to add to this insult of cutting this, or to add to the insult of cutting the wage, already meager wages is an offense to the profession. The reality is that we are facing an unprecedented teacher shortage with no end in sight, leading teachers to forego our planning and our lunches in order to cover the classes of our missing colleagues. And this proposed budget solution to shortage is to pay teachers less while requiring us to do more. It just doesn't make sense. This budget makes Baltimore County less competitive than our surrounding counties and represents a betrayal of what Dr. Williams said was his stated goal of investing in people. Who can in good faith recommend this profession to others under these circumstances? Thank you. Our next speaker is Chantel Breen. Good evening. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Chantal Breen, and I am a highly effective teacher with Baltimore County, now in my 22nd year. I know you have been hearing from families and teachers recently concerning the fate of the virtual learning program, and we appreciate your time and attention to our concerns. I am here this evening to speak on behalf of my students, families, and colleagues. Last school year, I joined the VLP because over COVID, I learned a lot about myself as a teacher and my students. I grew professionally and found new joy in my career. Even through COVID, I saw students blossom in the virtual environment. My VLP colleagues feel the same way. We all took a leap of faith and have worked very hard to build and support this program. Now in our second year with the VLP, we are constantly amazed at the progress that our students are making. We have developed class communities and friendships. We have a successful tutoring program, a yearbook, a newspaper, talent shows, clubs, and lunch bunches. I teach seventh grade math. I log in every day to find all of my students there for homeroom at 7.45 in the morning. We have a wonderful class meeting and roll right into our lesson. There are so many days that we forget what time it is because we are having so much fun engaging in the lesson before realizing it's time to leave. I watch students from all over our school system learning together and developing friendships. And since there are very few distractions, our learning blocks are packed with meaningful instruction. This is what it's like to learn and teach in the VLP. 
Throughout my entire career, I have been encouraged to differentiate, to meet the individual needs of my students, to use data to drive my instruction and meet my students where they are and move them forward. Differentiation is good instruction. So imagine my disappointment when I see my own school system failing to see how offering a virtual learning program is differentiating instruction, something that teachers do every day in their classrooms. Many of our students are in the VLP because it is where they, be, they, they learn best. Their performance demonstrates that this is where they belong. Many of these students have been successful in a virtual environment for three years now. This week we asked our students why they want the VLP and in just two days over 400 students responded. 30% said the main reason they want the program is that they feel safe in the VLP. The remaining said all of the above. They feel safe, they're healthy, and their grades have improved. BCPS students and their families should have the choice to learn in an environment that allows them to be successful. The VLP can also support schools by supplementing courses and providing a centralized learning environment for our head and shoulders students across the county. As a school system, we need to acknowledge that this program provides equitable access to high quality instruction and it's beneficial to many of our students, currently over a thousand. The VLP community, its students, families, and teachers urge the school board to support and fund the VLP for the next school year and every school year moving forward. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lloyd Allen. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board, thank you for your time. I am Lloyd Allen, Special Educator in Mathematics, speaking as an individual in support of amending the budget. As a member of hashtag Team BCPS, I'm noticing that as an organization, we keep looking outside of ourselves for answers. We want the Wizard of Oz to give us substitutes, an efficiency review, computer technicians, contracted related service providers, and curricula. We could have all of that if we were to look within ourselves. We don't need to hire outside experts to perform our core functions. Our curricula used to show up on the income side of the balance sheet rather than the expense side. We don't need to hire outside experts to perform our core functions. We pay $2 million in overhead to administrate substitutes, and there are still buildings where teachers have daily coverage. We don't need to hire outside experts to perform our core functions. We can't attract speech language pathologists to fill our vacancies, so we end up having to pay an inflated rate for contractors. We don't need to hire outside experts to perform our core functions, but we do need to compensate our own people with what they are worth. The surrounding counties are starting to figure that out. Do you remember when we used to post poach teachers from the county to our east? because those teachers felt underpaid and unappreciated. Now we know folks who are resigning this year to transfer to that place. I know teachers who are resigning from us to transfer to the South, saying that they'll make another $4,000 or more per year, and that they just can't turn that down to support their family. The president of the Board of Education of the jurisdiction to our West was quoted in the Sun last month. We have got to try to maintain and retain these educators, and even with these salaries, we're just gonna fight right now with neighboring counties, us. You have got to remember that people were not going into the teaching profession like they used to 20 years ago, and that hurts us also, that really hurts. We are all going to be competing for the same few educators that come out of college every year now. The surrounding counties are fighting over us. Is hashtag Team BCPS fighting to keep us? If morale had been down before the efficiency study, I mean, last meeting a parent reported that their kindergarten had class size in the high 20s. Eliminating vacant positions doesn't eliminate the need for those positions to have been filled. It is not okay that in bold italic underline, it is important to emphasize that the only salary increases included in the FY24 budget book are step increases for all eligible employees. Please receive direct answers to your direct questions about which job titles were affected by the cuts. Please fix the salary schedule as was negotiated last year. Please allow us to succeed with class size small enough that we may lift every voice. Our core function is learning. Give us the resources, including the investment in our people to make that happen. We've had the ruby slippers all along. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Darren Bedillo. Mr. Badillo. Our, 
Our next speaker is Julie Coletta. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Little old crowd today. That's a good thing. Good evening. Uh, my, name is, uh, my name is Darren Badillo. I'm a concerned father, uh, but I'm here today as the Director of Operations uh, for the Baltimore Youth Coalition, a youth mentorship program. And I asked one of the senior, one of the high schoolers uh, this week, how's school going? Um, and it broke my heart. He said, uh, I'm just trying to survive. And I want to share a letter that he wanted me to share with you guys tonight. Uh, so my high school has many problems. Not every high school is perfect, but mine has many flaws. The hallways are always rowdy and very catastrophic, uh, claustrophobic. Not, many bre not much breathing room, so kids like myself are always bumping into one another, and that can cause a small verbal or physical altercation. Speaking of altercations, my school fights are wild and usually over something that isn't important or serious. Recently, we had about nine to 12 fights within the past two months, and kids are body slammed, using brass knuckles to take out their anger towards someone else. And I've seen some of my friends get threatened with knives and weapons. Kids are also selling drugs, smoking weed, using vapes, cigarettes, drinking hard liquor, but my principal, my school principal does try to enforce the safety of my fellow students. He's done hallway sweeps, limited times you can use the bathroom, and even tried to have our phones put away in envelopes so our attention span is more focused towards our work than our phones. But it just doesn't work. My school is so badly damaged, especially in the bathroom stalls. Doors are missing, mirrors are broken, my school was really understaffed. My science teacher was a long-term sub. Then she got fired because she was not doing anything. Then we had several short-term subs. All we did in that class was stuff we already, le already le previously learned. Although we have an actual long-term sub who actually teaches, we went quite through some time with just doing some basic eighth grade science. Some students have zero respect for their peers and the teachers, the staff, administrators. It's truly a shame that Baltimore County public schools have become this way. I find it truly disturbing. I can't even imagine what other schools are truly going through. My little sister has just gotten to her first grade, and there are times when I pick her up and I hear these little kids, not even in fifth grade yet, talk about selling drugs, fighting, and threats being made upon them. I share this with you. I'm here speaking at the school board for the past three years, and sometimes it feels like Groundhog's Day. I say the same thing, nothing changes. Um, I can imagine what these students go through every day. What's being done, it seems like nobody is fighting for our children's safety or the learning environment. So I'm just asking you, asking somebody here to make safety and the learning environment a top priority. I, don't, I haven't seen it yet, but these kids are crying. Some of these kids are just looking for an opportunity. They escaped the streets to go to school to be somebody, but now they can't even escape the streets or school because they ain't even safe in school. Please do something. And I'm glad to see all the teachers here today in supporting for themselves, and I want to see, see them continue to rally for our children's education and safety. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julie Coletta. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Vice Chair Harvey, um, Board Chair Lichter, and Board Representative Ms. Dominowski. My name is Julie Collada, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the parents, teachers, and students at Hampton Elementary. We are extremely grateful to all of you for your attention to our school and the significant overcrowding that our students and teachers are facing every day. This is a serious problem that is weighing on our community, and we have pleaded with you since January for a long-term solution. Yesterday, as Robin shared, we were notified that we'll be receiving four trailers for the upcoming school year, and this is not a solution, but a Band-Aid for the overcrowding at Hampton. As many of our board representatives are new, you might not know that Hampton Elementary was in a similar situation 12 years ago, with 150 students over capacity. In 2011, Hampton had a student population of 450 in a building with a capacity of 307. We had 10 trailers with half of the population outside of the school building. Hampton parents fought hard for the $19 million addition and renovation in 2012, which increased our capacity to 670. While the addition added 24 classrooms, our bathrooms, gymnasium, and cafeteria were untouched, and they do not support our current student population of 811. It's extremely disappointing that poor planning has led us back to this place in just 11 years. BCPS must plan better. We have been asking for weeks now for BCPS to please consider an emergency boundary study for Hampton Elementary, but you haven't. 
So we've done the research and we have found that multiple neighboring schools are under capacity. One school in particular that neighbors Hampton's boundary is under capacity by 100 students. Putting up four trailers is extremely expensive and a poor use of funds when the maps and BCPS school profiles clearly show that a boundary change could offer a solution. As I've said, they are not a solution to this problem. They are a Band-Aid, and our school will surely be over 900 students come September, an unacceptable population for an elementary school with a gym and cafeteria built for 300. Hampton is not alone in this struggle of overcrowding. BCPS has failed to adequately plan and project accurate student enrollment across the county. Hampton has already surpassed our enrollment projection for 2031 by 60 students. I would ask the board and the strategic planning to, committee to carefully consider the facts as you continue to develop a solution for the overcrowding at Hampton. Hampton has 811 students using a cafeteria and gym for 307. We have kindergarten classes, my sons, that have 27 students. And even with four trailers, next year we will have at least 27 students in all of the primary grades. And that doesn't account for any new students. And finally, there are seats available in neighboring schools. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Keith Tabor. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Keith Tabor, and I am the proud parent of two Baltimore County students. Earlier this year, I began to look into how grades were being assigned and the way Schoology was calculating them. I was immediately concerned, and here's a quick example illustrating the concern. A teacher gives three math assessments, a five-question test, a 10-question quiz, and a 50-question math fact practice. The teacher enters the scores into the grade book as five out of five for the test, nine out of 10 for the quiz, and 35 out of 50 for the speed drill. Schoology calculates this by adding all the numerators and dividing it by the denominators. This equates to a 75.3% average using a points-based average. Alternatively, if each of these grades were calculated individually as a percentage, it would be 86.6%, an 11.3% increase and a better representation of a body of work. As a matter of fact, using the points-based average that Baltimore City or County currently uses, they could fail both the quiz and the test completely, ace the speed drill, and have an 88.46%. As a concrete example, a BCPS middle school has three grades in the major component on one of the core scores out of 10, 10, and 50 points. The 50-point grade accounts for 71.4% of the overall grade. In another class, a student has seven A's and an assignment that wasn't graded yet, and that showed as a zero out of 10. And during that grade, that time was 69.44%. This score does not represent a whole body of work. Many other parents I have spoken to throughout the district have stated they have classes that look like this as well, and I can provide the examples if needed. I come before to you today to explain the importance of fixing this immediately. Hundreds if not thousands of grades are affected by this incorrect implementation. Over the past four months, I've sent emails to central office, school board members, the CAO, and met with executive directors. Seemingly almost nothing has been done to address this. We've now gone through multiple grades cycles where this is being applied incorrectly. During my last correspondence with Dr. Holmes, I was informed that the district was preparing to plan to train teachers at my daughter's school on the grading policy. He stated, we are very aware this is not an independent Sudbrook Middle School issue. Our approach is to begin where the concern was raised. If the district is aware this is not a school level issue, the first response cannot and should not be working with an individual school. If this is a district problem, and it is, the immediate steps need to impact all students in the district. Fixing this issue for one of my children and not for all of the other BCPS students is unacceptable, inequitable, and insulting to all the other students in the district. There are a multitude of ways to fix this for this year almost immediately. You can implement a percentage model for each assignment. You can train all staff on the grading manual explaining how the points matter in their grade book. Many teachers that I've spoken to have stated they haven't received any professional development on grading this century, or this decade, I apologize. Um, the BCPS mandated math assessments are all scored uh, upon use the number of questions as well. Or three, you could train a multitude of teachers to conduct gradebook audits at every school throughout the county. If Baltimore County Public Schools and the school board are fighting for equity within the school system, you will fix this immediately. As a fellow educator, I've spent... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Shane Henry.
I wish a good evening to the Board of Education, my peers, and county stakeholders. I am Shane Henry. I speak to you today as an experienced educator who has been who has seen many initiatives come and go in my 25 years of teaching. We can analyze data and policy all day long, but if you're listening to public comments this evening, it is, it's to get a sense from the human side of what's happening in our schools, and we're drowning. I am here to ask the Board of Education to fulfill their obligation to our children in the future of Baltimore County, Maryland. Why, after two audits, do we have, still have redundancies in mid-level management? For example, what is the difference between an executive director of academic services, one for teaching and learning, and one for academic programs? These positions pulling in 2,000 K plus a year seem to overlap in purpose and title. What is their role? How do they directly benefit students? Why, after two audits, do we still employ companies that create redundancy. For example, we have Performance Matters and Schoology to analyze student data to drive instruction. Constant testing, surveying, and data analysis proves yet again to students that we see them as numbers, not people. Why, after two audits, do we still implement policies that do not help high-risk students? Our current superintendent cut the staff at alternative environment schools. What he did was he removed consequences. Students are demonstrating with overwhelming evidence through the number of fights, drug use, sexual misconduct, insubordination, and general lack of regard for adults in the building that they are not afraid of consequences. They have none. This has paralyzed teachers' ability to teach. He hid behind the inappropriate policies by avoiding disciplinary consequences due to the students' behavior to ensure the suspension rates remain favorable. This sends a message yet again that we care more about numbers than we do kids. This year, the super Superintendent's budgets, budget increased the class ratio in high schools from 25 to 1 to 29 to 1. This mathematical semantics are meant to manipulate society into thinking there is not a teacher shortage. This is appalling. Increasing class sizes to project an air of confidence that will not solve the staffing crisis. Um, if you're going to throw money at a problem, you're throwing it in the wrong places. If you want great educators, you need to pay for them. If the board does not find the funds for the compressed pay scale to increase career earnings for folks with master's degrees, then you're gonna get what you pay for. Our society deserves to, re to recruit and retain world-class educators for our students. The data, there is data that backs the, backs the aforementioned. Stop rubber stamping ineffective policies. Our students do not need more money thrown at them in executive titles, more technology, and redundant programs that frustrate those forced to use them. They need confident, supported people working with them daily in the classroom to see them as individuals, not data points. Unfortunately, educators are leaving at unprecedented rates. We do what is right for the current taxpayers that will create a bright future. Have a great evening and thank you for your time. The next item was added to the agenda, which is contract awards, and for that I call on Mr. Hartlove and Ms. Webster. Okay. Okay, excuse me one sec, but don't move. Um, the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call Mr. Bursades. Good evening, nothing to report from closed session. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> next on the agenda is the contract awards, and for that we have Mr. Hartlove and Ms. Webster. And I will uh, turn it over to Ms. Webster, who has done the, all the work on this, so I'm not going to take any of the credit. So, okay. Ms. Webster. Yeah. All right. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is contract MWE-807-23, executive search firm for superintendent. This is a new competitively bid contract for an executive search firm to support the superintendent search for the Board of Education. Approval is requested for a one-year, four-month contract term with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $150,000.
May I have a motion to approve the contract? MWE 80723, ex executive search firm for superintendent. So moved, Pumphrey. May I have Second. a <laughs> Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the, and thank you, Ms. Webster, for all your work with us. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the superintendent's proposed FY 2024 operating budget. Um, and before I call on Dr. Williams, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that we realize that a survey was created and posted on some of our Board of Ed members' Facebook pages last week to elicit feedback from their communities on their budget priorities. We appreciate the members of the public who took the time to respond to provide board members with additional feedback. It is important to realize that the timing of the survey and the inconsistent distribution of the survey makes it difficult to incorporate the suggestions into the FY24 budget which must be sent to the county executive on March 1st. The board realizes the value and importance of stakeholder input. As a board, we will be working on ways to enhance the budget process and timeline for FY25. Increasing community input will be a priority in that work. And now I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. As we prepare for tonight's upcoming final budget session, we will present updates on our virtual learning program, athletic trainers, and compensation. At the conclusion of each brief presentation, we will respond to questions about the pre presentation content. We believe that critical context is important to ensure that all board members have as much information as possible and ask that all requested changes and direction to the plan are shared at the conclusion of Mr. Hartlove's budget update. Uh, so thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share an update regarding uh, several programs. I will ask the team to move forward, Dr. Yarborough, Doug El Dr. Elmendorf, I apologize, and Ms. Julie Forbes at this time. And Dr. Boswell McComas. Okay. Dr. Boswell McComas, thank you. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. So we're starting with virtual learning program, correct? Correct. All right. All right. All right. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Williams. Uh, we are pleased to be able to provide an update as requested on virtual learning programs. Next slide, please. As you know, Baltimore County Public Schools has a long history of providing virtual learning opportunities to students in secondary schools, primarily through e-learning. All e LEAs in the state of Maryland were directed to provide a systematic re response to meet the needs of the pandemic. Our virtual learning program was funded with one-time ESSER funds, and the original plan included funding for FY22 and FY23. Although the program was scheduled to sunset in FY24, options to sustain safe and supportive environments, student support for those with physical and mental health needs, administrative placements, staffing shortages in schools, and family preferences pointed towards the need to continue VLP for FY24. The cost of our current VLP program is $16.5 million. The proposed costs for FY24 would be 6.6 .6 million. In a moment, we will share updated details that include enrollment for students 
and additional supports. We acknowledge that VLP is a program that many families find useful. We are committed to continuing it. As the earlier speaker from VLP mentioned, we too support creating an environment that is safe, healthy, and where all students are able to achieve improved grades. Next slide, please. In response to a question posed last meeting regarding the cost of VLP, you'll note on this slide the current cost to fund the proposed cost. Students that are in the virtual learning program are co-enrolled in both the home school and the virtual learning program. This results in expenditures for the cost of students at, in the VLP program as well as paying for the students in brick and mortar. This is because students currently may return to their home school at any time. There is no policy that requires placement for a year or more in the VLP. No staffing is taken away from schools. All schools remain fully staffed. Our school enrollment varies anywhere from schools having one student that attends the VLP to 38 students that attend the VLP, with the exception of the eight schools that we provide staffing relief to. Those eight schools include two middle schools and six high schools for this current year. As we consider the serious impact of the upcoming federal fiscal cliff, this revised plan that we are providing this evening allows us to meet the needs of all current families and create a reduced staffing model from 126 teacher level staff to approximately 68 that can be sustained in the future and lessen the impact of the cliff in 2025. Next slide, please. This slide reflects the current student enrollment in the secondary levels of the VLP for student placements that include administrative transfers, school conduct hearing officer placements, home and hospital services, approved medical admissions, and program review placements. At this time, there are approximately 54 students enrolled in the middle school VLP and 55 in the high school VLP for these various placements. Projecting ahead, we anticipate the need to hold at least 75 seats per secondary level based on current enrollment trends. Next slide, please. The table on the left shows the current enrollment by grade level. There is a column for students who are enrolled through one of the placements we just discussed, and the voluntary column reflects full-time students who are voluntarily enrolled with the VLP. When looking ahead to the next school year, we look at the enrollment for students in a grade level and project it to the next grade level. For example, the current third grade students will be enrolled in fourth grade next year. Based on this, there are approximately 930 student seats needed. We recognize that some students and families may opt to return to their in-person school, so these enrollment numbers may decrease, but this provides a placeholder. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ms. Forbes. Based on the feedback that we received at our last meeting, we are sharing a revised proposal for VLP in 23-24. The 2023-2024 VLP will include grades four through 12, which would allow VLP students who are currently enrolled in grades three through 11 to maintain their full-time enrollment in VLP in 2023-2024 school year if they so choose. VELP students who are currently enrolled in grades one or two will transition back to in-person learning for the 23-24 school year. For students who transition back to their schools of primary enrollment, as we shared last time, it is our absolute goal to ensure that they are supported in this process. VLP staff will share articulation information with staff at each child's primary school of enrollment to schedule their classes and related services. The program will also continue to accommodate student placement decisions. Providing staffing support to brick and mortar schools has been a critical component of this year's VLP and is a strategy we plan to continue by working proactively with schools to determine vacancies that are not likely to be filled and then leveraging the unique nature of the centralized environment of the virtual learning program to staff the identified courses up to 15 teachers. Next slide, please. This table provides a few more data points related to our proposal. 
The top row here shows current class size averages for each level for some context. In the 2023-2024 school year, the VLP will include 150 seats between fourth and fifth grades, 420 in the middle school and 504 in the high school. As was mentioned previously, 150 seats will be available between middle and high school for student placements related to discipline, health, and other identified needs. The total capacity for the 23-24 school year is 1,074, which again accommodates all VLP students currently in grades 3 through 11 to return and also provides seats for placement decisions. Next slide, please. Thank you. So questions? Ms. Demonowski? So this is with the current 6 million, 6.7 budget that we already have? That's correct. Okay. What is the total enrollment right now? Or that's? About 1,100. And then the, the, the new, students. and the new proposed is 1094, so I think. 1074. Is, right. Okay. But for just the 6 million. Okay. Just a question, quick question. There's a question just from Ms. Dr. Hager. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I thought you were talking. I just want a clarification on the grades that the new proposal will be. Is it third to 12th or fourth to 12th? Good question. It's a little confusing because our students are matriculate into the next grade. So it would be fourth through 12th next year, which would accommodate our current third through 11th students. Sure. Dr. Hager. I have a concrete question and a philosophical question. Um, the first one is the concrete question. So is the cost savings come because they're no longer co-enrolled with their brick and mortar school? Is that why we're saving from last time? Well, one of the primary reasons that um, there's a cost savings is because when we talk about um, staffing relief, we're talking about working proactively with schools to identify what needs they might have and then using that FTE in the VLP. Currently, we use VLP um, staffing to accommodate staffing relief um, so we wouldn't have to be we, we wouldn't have to do that so that provides a lot more space in the in the staffing so now if a substitute is needed and instead of pulling from a, a teacher from the VLP students would sit in a classroom and log on online they do that currently and we use current VLP staffing to do that and, and next year we're proposing that we would continue to do that but we would use the staffing from the school in which we are providing the staffing relief can I? Dr. Hager, if, if I could provide a little more uh, additional information. So for example, School X has a chemistry vacancy. Uh, this year we were using ESSER funding to pay for a VLP teacher. A long-term substitute would supervise the students or whatever, you know, whoever the school um, identified would supervise the students daily. But the VLP teacher that was paid using ESSER funding was providing the daily instruction, was uh, doing the assessments, was providing that feedback. In this revised model, School X working with the office would identify, we need a chemistry teacher for next year. They have that chemistry allocation using operating funds. So we would uh, secure that teacher for them. VLP gives greater flexibility because the neighboring school might also need some chemistry relief, but the funding no longer is coming from the ESSA grant funds. And so therefore we're not contributing to the cliff and we're using the funding that's already allocated for the students based on the number of st students that attend that school. I, I think I follow that logic. Okay. Um, all right, here's my big philosophical question that I've been thinking about a lot with this. Um, I, I appreciate the breakdown between the 150 students with the different medical need placements and administrative placements. And to me, that's a great way to use the VLP. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I get hung up a bit on the 900 choice kids. So these are, like, we're not a school choice district, yet we're allowing families to make a choice about sending their children to school in different settings. And I, I guess that's my philosophical stance where I, I'm not quite sure I, um, I feel okay with that concept. Is that how you see it too or do you see a, d a different rationale? I, that, that's a great question, thank you. I, I would just say that um, what we're trying to do is make sure that we can continue to provide a virtual opportunity for students who are already enrolled. So the choice that they made was back to you know, two falls ago, 
um, and we're trying to accommodate the fact that they're st are currently enrolled and, and continue with enrollment. So there isn't an open enrollment um, option at this point where people could choose to come into the virtual learning program. Uh, Mr. McMillian? Partially correct. So we have found a way to, uh, one of the slides that I think Dr. Elmendorf or actually Ms. Forb went over um, showed you the current class sizes. Um, currently when you're using, you know, ESSER funding, the way that the students went in and that they also had their seats in the uh, traditional classroom, the class sizes were much smaller. If we're aligning the um, sections to the same guidance that we're using in brick and mortar, we're be able to actualize some cost savings there. So you look at that as a portion of the cost savings, you put that together with the staffing relief that we're providing to identified schools where we were using previously ESSER funding as opposed to operating budget that we've already included in those budgets for schools. And it's putting those two things together that allows us to serve these students in this way. You're welcome. Mr. Manowski. Uh, just to follow up on Ms. Hager's uh, comment about the choice, the, the kids that have chosen to be in VLP, this will be their final year and they will be notified that they will have to go back. You know, this is the final year of VLP for choosing to be in VLP. Will we still be allowed, will, will we still, VLP still be allowed for the appointments as far as, you know, if for uh, medical or administrative or whatever reason. Am I clarifying that well? I, I, am I, if, if I'm hearing you correct, Ms. McCombs. Dr. McCombs. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ms. Dominowski. It's a great question, you know, because we really will, as, and we, we know that there is interest in a virtual option in the, for the long haul. Right, and so I think Dr. Yarborough's uh, thoughtful way of, of finding additional ways to leverage available FTEs um, to help us uh, with next year is part of the work that we're gonna have to do next fall. We're gonna have to seriously look at how do we provide a long-term solution that meets the needs of our school system. So I think it's clear that we have a need. Uh, we have something similar to that in e-learning, and we're talking about um, what is the long-term evolution of these two programs to make sure that we have that versatility? You know, once we have that versatility, which we've, we've learned this year and we're extending into next year, we certainly won't, don't want to take that versatility away, uh, but we want to be as forward-thinking with our families as possible around uh, their needs and transparent with them around uh, what we have to offer. So long story short, it's really something we're going to have to determine because that will affect the following uh, budget cycle. Uh, and as Dr. Yarbrough said, and we all know, uh, that we're gonna have to reconcile the things that uh, we currently have benefit from the ESSER grants uh, with our FY25 budget. Thank but um, I mean, that's kind of why we are here now is because we didn't give warning to the VLP's parents that chose to be in there. So we had to extend it. Are we gonna be in the same situation a year from now? No, because we need to make, we need to do that work in the fall, right? So that, like, that is the work that we need to do August through October so that we have decisions made and that we're all on the same sheet of music around what financially we're going to um, allocate either out of um, current um, budget, you know, FTEs, or um, request in the FY25 cycle. So you'll see as we work through, this is your first budget cycle, but as we work through the next budget cycle, you're gonna see that there's a lot of decision making that happens in the first quarter of the school year to prepare that budget. And then you have to decide what of your maintenance of effort budget you're willing to allocate towards that, and what are you going to ask for in the upcoming budget cycle. Just forgive me, I thought it was part of, Ms. Litcher said that this was, it, we were gonna extend this as long as we let that chose the parents that chose to keep their kids in VLP know that this will be the final year of it. 
So I'm just confused a little. Well, I thought your question was, right, we're going to have it for next year. And I thought your question was for the year after. I thought that was the question I was it asking. It was, but okay. what, what I'm saying is, are we going to let the VLP parents know this is the final year of VLP for, for choosing to be in the program? I see. The, the communication, I think that's part of our communication in the fall. And Mr. Manowski, I think I made the motion last time, but then we stopped that motion, which was just extended for this year due to communication and then decided the use of virtual. So I, I think that's where you're getting the motion from last time that we didn't pass. But Dr. McComas, I think even November is late. Like if we think of our magnet timelines and other timelines, we may need to push that really to the start of the school year as far as bringing back what does what is we envisioning virtual learning looking like in the future so we can let parents know as soon as possible so that other options that have timelines don't you know, collide. Agreed, October is a good time. Thank you. Dr. Williams, were you gonna? No, I was just going to comment. Thank you for the feedback, just like we do any program. Um, I remember the conversation at the last meeting. There's some communication timelines we need to provide. We do recognize how this has benefit, benefited some students who needed that additional option. But the original design of the virtual learning was in response to COVID. But we saw some progress. And so, as Dr. Bosmer McComas said, we'll be talking about that and developing a, a plan of action so we can communicate that, what that will look like the following year. Thank you. Ms. Hen, did you have a question? I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, what we're hearing from families of the VLP is that they feel this is already a permanent option. And I know we've communicated that the funding was ending and that's um, clear. However, the work seems to have already started when this no longer became an emergency option. And my question is for Dr. McComas then, to hear you say that that work hasn't started, it seems like it started when we started adding resources and it became a program. Because it was no longer an emergency response, it now, became a program and it has a website and it has resources and staffing and it is a true educational option. So while we don't have open enrollment, our families were not expecting it to end. We've heard that almost universally from um, people who've been asking for it to continue. So my question is, I'm, I'm a bit confused hearing you say that the work has not yet started. It, and if that's the case, then it needs to start. And it, it needs to start immediately because we need to know what's going to happen with this program. And and I agree that it feels like it's going to evolve to become a permanent option. And the board needs to be part of those discussions. So could you comment on what you see as the next steps and where do we go from here? And, and I certainly agree with Ms. Domanowski that we have to set expectations and we cannot wait until the fall. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you Ms. Hen for the opportunity to clarify. So when I say the work's not yet begun, I don't mean that w our team, we've had many conversations over the last 18 months around um, the evolution of VLP and, and to what extent and when, at what point does VLP um, become a permanent part of our school portfolio or at what point do we sunset it because the crisis from which it was born is over. Uh, so we have talked about many different evolutions and, and we have options that we could discuss. Um, what I mean by that work beginning is it is fundamentally at this point a financial decision. And so that annual budget cycle, typically what happens is my teams and I begin discussing budget needs in July each year. Um, and so typically our chiefs um, work through their budget process uh, request uh, through the July, August, and September. In October and November, we're able to then put forward our budget proposals, and that work continues. The budget process is 12 months long. Um, and so when I say that work has not yet begun, it's really the discussion around the financial decisions that would support it. We as a community at the end of the day have 
um, two options to think about long-term funding, right? Because we know our current funding with the grant will uh, go away. Um, and so we have fundamentally uh, two budget actions that we can do. We can, in each budget cycle, request FTEs to support this program. Um, or we would have to look at how we allocate the staff that's in our maintenance of effort budget, right? And so just as Dr. Yarbrough has used some thoughtful way of, of saying if we have a school that um, meant a number of their students are participating in VLP and there's availability, we can tap into part of that FTE to help sustain this. So we're going to have to decide, uh, you know, what is our, our budget strategy? Is it to leverage just the FTEs that we have in our maintenance of effort and or are we going to request additional FTEs as part of our FY25 budget cycle. So I hope I clarified Ms. Hen that that to me is what I was referring to when I said that work Thank has you. to begin. It's really around that long term financial decision making. In terms of the instructional program, We've had lots of conversations and we're very proud of how the program has continued to be successful and we continue to take very seriously uh, this different format for teaching students and I think uh, there's clear support, you know, families are uh, pleased. You've seen the data in some of our quarterly reports throughout the last 18 months. Um, and so we're constantly looking to make sure that we're delivering a high quality experience uh, and focused on learning in this process. Um, but fundamentally as a community, if we are choosing to provide a long-term solution, we're gonna have to find a long-term funding solution. And that's either maintenance of effort and or asking for additional FTEs to support it. So I hope I clarified, Ms. Hen. You did. Thank you very much My for that pleasure. clarification. And, and thank you also to Mr. Hartlove because this was a discussion that the Budget Committee um, entertained and I know it's a lot of work that's going to um, be involved in in these discussions. I would just encourage you to um, continue to bring these thoughts to the board and if you could allow us to provide input that would be fantastic. But yes, it is a success story for the program that we're even having this conversation. So. Thank you, and thank you to everyone involved in the VLP. Thank you, and last comment on VLP, and then we're gonna move on to another budget topic. Ms. Hassan. Thank you, so I think, um, I think the discussion that we're having is absolutely essential just because we're seeing, you know, we're beginning to see different students' needs. We're beginning to see, you know, the importance of the VLP and how we've really evolved the VLP from being, you know, some emergency procedure to something, um, to a longstanding program. And on that topic, I think it's also important just to mention the options that we have with alternative education, um, such as the EDLP, such as e-learning, because because as we as we discuss, you know, funding um, the VLP and watching that almost phase out and, and shift to what we, you know, what we may intend or what we may, you know, desire, um, it is important to support um, students and those opportunities to pursue um, alternatives because th that need is there. Um, but the solution is is more than just one program. So I, I implore you, I won't be here next year, um, so I implore you in the next upcoming budget cycle um, truly to consider all of these alternatives that we are very fortunate to have heard from parents, students, teachers, staff about the importance of the VLP and its necessity and, and taking all of those comments and all of those needs and transforming it into this budget cycle as well as the upcoming budget cycle with additional alternatives. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Williams, next topic. Yes, so thank you team for providing that update. Thank you board for your clarifying questions. Our next topic is on athletic trainers. I would like to call up Michael Sai, Michael Sargent, and Dr. Yarbrough. You may as well stay right where you are. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening again, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, members of the board. Uh, we are appreciative of the opportunity to share with you an information regarding athletic trainers and BCPS. Next slide, please. 
Baltimore County Public Schools support the philosophy that a quality, equitable, and safe interscholastic athletic program is vital to the positive social, emotional, physical, and educational development of all students. Our programs enhance and support the mission of the school system to increase student achievement as evidenced by the countywide all academic team and the statewide Minds in Motion program. In 1994, BCPS began utilizing certified athletic trainers to provide medical coverage for their interscholastic athletic programs. At present, Eastern Technical High School is the only school that has an athletic trainer on staff within the school system. She is a full-time teacher, duly certified and licensed to teach, and an athletic trainer. Her training responsibilities are for 10 hours per week. A certified athletic trainer is a medical professional who at minimum has a bachelor's degree, now those requirements have been changed, to require a master's from an accredited college or university and fulfill the requirements for certification. Our current structure includes contracted athletic trainers from hospitals and healthcare providers, as well as EDAs available for staff members to provide coverage for certified staff members. During this school year in our 24 high schools, 14 schools have athletic trainer coverage and 10 schools do not. Next slide. For years we have tried to move forward implementation of certified athletic trainers in our schools. Research supports that athletic trainers can make a significant difference in sports safety. Schools with an, athletic trainer, with an athletic trainer report that their student athletes sustain fewer injuries, both acute and reoccurring, than athletes at schools without athletic trainers. Having athletic trainers on staff also improves the rate of our early detection of dehydration, head injuries, other sports-related health issues, and general medical health issues. With this in mind, we begin internally exploring the cost of feasibility of transitioning to 24 full-time positions um, certified athletic trainers for our high schools. This slide details the cost. In order to, to hire 24 master level certified athletic trainers and one 12 month supervisor, the cost would be approximately $3.2 million. We acknowledge that this is a big number. We are committed to increasing sports safety in Baltimore County and understand the current fiscal constraints and our shared commitment to prioritize recruitment and retention of student of staff members in BCPS. With that in mind, we have identified the following alternative proposal to increase player safety. We are committed to providing funds for all 24 high schools to hire athletic trainers services, increase the number of hours of coverage at each school, and move forward with a three-year phase-in transition plan for our athletic trainer FTE. With year, with year one starting at 10 trainers and then the remaining 14 over the next two years. At, at the end, that's the end of our presentation. Um, we are open to take any questions, and thank you. Questions? Mr. McMillian. Dr. Yarbrough, I'm a, uh, you know, I look for this presentation, you know, since the agenda came out last week, for the opportunity to study it. And, you know, I'm a little disappointed that people haven't had the opportunity to see this. Some of these charts, you know, they go by so quickly, and you look at it on a screen, and it's really hard to take it in and digest it and, uh, you know, come up with, with what that chart really means. It's kind of like watching the NFL football, and you've got all these charts, and it's hard to decipher what you mean. So you've, you've currently got 10 programs, Mr. Sight, and I've got to watch my time. Uh, so there's 10 high schools that don't have programs. Yes. How many middle schools are there? 27. Okay, 27. How many, how many middle schools are serviced by a trainer? None. None. And out of the, the 14 high schools, or out of the 24 high schools we have, how many thousands of athletes do we have? Roughly between middle and high? No, just high school. Oh, roughly 12,000. 12,000. 12, so the middle schools don't have any coverage. Was the plan kind of sort of that if we had full-time trainers, the full-time trainers would go into the middle schools and work with those athletes in some regard? Yes. Um, so if we were to go with this model, 
um, our hopes would, would be taking those 24 trainers and then dividing them up amongst the 26, 27 middle schools to provide them some type of drop-in coverage to have both at the middle and at the high school. Is your middle school program growing at all times? Yes, we're, we've continued to expand over the last three years. How many sports do you offer? We offer seven. How many kids do you, you view in the middle school? Roughly three, 3,500. Okay, so you're looking at 15, 16,000 total. Uh, okay, I'll pass, but I want to come back. Okay, other questions or comments? Ms. Domanowski? I just wanted to know if there um, is or can be any communications with outsourced, like outsourcing funding, maybe with professional teams around the area or just completely national, like this could be a national movement. I mean, it's been in the news with DeMar Hamlin going down in the middle of the game, the, the need for IEDs, um, I mean, we, and, and uh, training staff and, on sports teams and sports fields is, it's a, it's a hot topic right now. And I think it's something that um, could be addressed as, you know, um, a funding from the outside, like a grant source with professional teams. Has that been looked into? We've, we have looked into funding uh, outside of Baltimore County. Uh, it has been difficult, um, to say the least. Um, we, we do currently subcontract with uh, third party ATI. Um, that provides some of our trainers, um, but um, we will continue to look for other sources of, of um, funds to help us provide trainers for our student athletes. Have you reached out to maybe the Orioles or the Ravens or anybody in, in that um, or NFL like league office or anything? I, I mean, I just feel like this is something that nationally will be supported by a lot of sports teams to try to get a fund together to make sure that all kids are playing safely at school. Uh, no, we have not reached out to them regarding funding. Um, I, I know that this, this is going on not just in Baltimore County, but across the state. So uh, we can reach out to them. I know that um, in some of our conversations that we had with members of their organizations, again, the, the whole trainer thing is just a big topic right now. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Oh, thanks. Um, I'm just jumping back to, uh, I believe, the second slide which just kind of illustrates where we currently are with athletic trainers. Why are there no contract, contracted athletic trainers for the other 10 schools? Why is there zero coverage there? Okay, I'll answer that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so I wanna say probably five years ago, we entered a contract so let me back up. There's currently two models that we have to, to outfit Baltimore County in terms of our athletic trainers. One is with the traditional model, which was EDA, um, where we hire athletic trainers. And then because of the need, we subcontracted with ATI, which covered the remaining 17 schools. After COVID hit, um, many of our athletic trainers found other um, jobs to do. And, and that's how we went from 17, um, you know, having all 24, down to, to only 10. So it's been a struggle. We have worked with the organization to try, but again, it's just been difficult to get um, trainers to come in, into the profession um, with one with the change in uh, requirements and then also with the pay. It's just to be clear, have we tried to get contract staff back in those other 10 high schools? Um, can you repeat that? So the 10 high schools that don't have any con any support, is there, have you attempted to hire contractors to go back in there or no? No, what we have done is that we've used uh, our resources in terms of um, hiring EMTs uh, to go in and to cover those games that we need to cover in terms of our football and lacrosse, which have to start with a medical person on, on site. Um, and then we, you know, also reach out to our other trainers at the other schools when, when needed regarding, you know, medical health issues. Okay, thank you. Dr. Hager. Um, thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge Mr. Sai actually gave a presentation to our local school health council about this a few months ago, and it was a wonderful discussion with a lot of medical professionals talking about the importance of this um, and having these individuals present, certainly in, at least the high school level. Um, I'm actually going to physical therapy now for an old high school sports injury, so I, I get it. You know, it really is important to address it um, in the moment for these kids who aren't likely going to raise their hand and say, I need to go to the doctor, and having someone who's professional and on site is just so important. Um, 
And I appreciate this proposal um, kind of starting where you are. I know, um, I believe we talked about this a few months ago that the gold standard would be to have you know someone in every school. But um, first of all, you know we're talking about the budget tonight. Mm -hmm. But I recall that you said that just finding those individuals right now. I know Ms. Dominowski said you know this is such a so many people are paying attention to this right now. These individuals are highly sought after. So is that another reason that we're starting smaller, just because of the pool is so tight right now? Yes, um, budget being the, the first thing, but then the pool is small, and we are going to be in competition with other jurisdictions. Uh, this, like everyone has said here tonight, this is a big topic in, in light of everything that's happened athletically across the country uh, and even within our own system. So with that being said, uh, our goal is to provide the safest environment that we possibly can for our student athletes at the end of the day, and at the end of the day, making sure that they get home to their parents. So what, what would the role of a full-time trainer even look like? I think if we hired the full-time, what, what would their day look like? That's a great question. So um, I didn't bring the job description with me today, but it, it would be um, a little bit different than a, a general, like a teacher, you know, from first thing in the morning till three. Um, they would come in probably around 11 o'clock. Um, I have worked and talked to uh, Debbie Somerville in terms of the coordination uh, with health services because many, I mean, all of our kids are student athletes, so they're they're in school all day. So they would come in, meet with the nurse to see if there's any problems as it relates to the health of the students that are athletes, do rehab and training up to the 2.30 hour, which, and then in preparation for games and stuff like that, prepare for that stuff, which would take you well into practice and then into game situations and then probably be done sometime around 9, 9 o'clock in the evening. Okay, so their day's time is flex. Yeah, it's, be flex, it's, it's right. flex. And then the, the um, proposed, the third option, right? You said there's three options? Well, I'm sorry. So technically, I mean, it was the initial option was all, all and right. then this would be a phase in approach okay. where we would look at um, hiring 10 for FY24 and then phasing in the remaining over the next, the following two years. So if we just did the 10, we would still use those other models that you're currently using to support schools that didn't have one yes, at the time. Yes, we would okay. continue to, we would use those 10 to, to help us um, with the remaining schools that are not, and then also tie into our EMT and other coverages that we have to make sure that we have coverages at our schools. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mr. McMillian. Is Deb, Deb Summerfield on this call? Does anybody know? No. She's not. No. no. I'm curious, does there appear to be, you know, are young people bringing more medical conditions with them now than they did 10 or 15 years ago? Uh, and, and, and I'd love to have somebody with a medical background, and maybe Dr. Hager could say that. No. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say so, the same thing. I can't answer that yeah. question. Um, Mr. Desai, we can't answer that question. Yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't answer that question. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, Dr. Williams, the next yes. topic. Well, we can. Thank you, team. I think we're going to um, come at the end for. Did you say in the beginning we we're going to wait and do? Yes, and, we're just trying to get some context, answers and then we'll do, to your questions. And then do. We have, this is the last one. I'm bringing forth Mr. Hartlove, our chief financial officer. Thank you. So I just want to reference and, and to thank Mr. Hartlove, uh, Wit, and team for the ongoing work, I, Dr. Boswell McComas stepped out, but she said, building a budget is a year-long process. If you recall what I presented during my first budget presentation was to show the, the needs of our system, but we have to work within the parameters of our county and our partners. So what Mr. Hartlove and team, we have work ongoing with our county executive and staff. The budget office has really worked hard to look at ways to prioritize our people. We had a room full of people earlier. We don't have that same room right now. We have worked with our union partners. I see three of them in the audience. It's about partnerships and relationships, but it's also about wins, and they may be small wins that will lead to bigger wins. So I want to reference that, but I also want to acknowledge with Tanliff 
Chris Hartlove and the budget team. They have worked nonstop every board meeting based on your feedback and questions. I have met with Chris many times with Ms. Charlie Green to try to address the ongoing questions from this board. So what I've asked Mr. Hartlove to do is provide an overview about some recommendations as we move forward with you making a decision about the board budget that will move forward to the county executive. So with that, I want to turn it over to Mr. Hartlove and if you can show that next PowerPoint. Thank, thank you, Dr. Williams and, and uh, good evening board members. Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and I just want to echo what you said about the budget office. They have been working, uh, you know, and I don't, you know, I, I appreciate the the, uh, uh, the the thank you from Dr. Williams, but the bulk of the work is being done by by the actual folks in the budget office. So all those qu the questions and really getting you good, thorough answers. They they did they did a. Uh, great job on that. So, so with that tonight, you're going to adopt your uh, budget request to the county, and we wanted to uh, just update, g give you some brief. This will be a brief presentation, but just uh, some updated information and some background information to help um, help you in your discussions. Um, the important thing to to note is is that we've had many ongoing uh, positive conversations with our county. Uh, budget folks, our counter counterparts, the CE. We've 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 talked to the CE. We've had very good conversations about the budget and trying to find uh, ways to to make it all work. And uh, the one thing that 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 has come up in these conversations um, is the uh, spending affordability uh, committee. This is something that uh, is is. Uh, it's a law, there's a spending affordability law in Carroll that ensures the growth in county spending does not exceed the rate of growth of the county's economy. So that's something that um, they're very aware of. And it comes, that's an annual report that comes out on February 15th each year. And it basically sets what the goal is of how much they can spend, um, or I say I should say we can spend as a, as a county. Um, and uh, what we learned in these conversations is that our current revenue request to the county, which is $36 million above last year, um, that is above what is allowed by the Spending Affordability uh, Committee. So with, with that feedback from the county, we worked uh, with the county on a revised revenue request of $23 million above FY 2023, which is uh, proposed to meet the county spending uh, guidelines. So that's our that's our goal um, with that. We've also understanding that the you know the answers aren't always on the revenue side. We've identified an additional 13.5 million in reductions, and that's over uh, and above the 24.8 million already included in the superintendent's budget to balance the budget and to support compensation above the step that is currently funded. Uh, um, so, and while we're talking about this, I, we also want to give you an update on the federal funding cliff because that's something that is certainly on the horizon and we've been talking about um, and planning for, um, but it actually is much more impactful of the, in the FY25 year. But our plan, as, as, as we are in motion right now, um, is looking towards the end of of the ESSER funding in, in FY25 um, is to evaluate the effectiveness of the programs funded by the ESSER uh, three fund or the ESSER, the ESSER funds in, in general, and that's in progress. And we have to make a decision on each and all, on all that spending, and it's whether we're going, it's either going to sunset uh, individual programs, they will be eliminated slash reduced, or they will continue. And uh, the one, the, the largest one that we really need to dis discuss when we get to FY25 is the 15 minutes that's built into the school day. That's something that's currently being covered by the um, ESSER funds. And uh, we're good next year, but in FY25 year, we need to build that into our FY um, in the general revenue and the gen general operating fund. That's something that has to continue because it's built into the it's built into salaries and the way we do our, our, our work um, here. Um, uh, note uh, that 
we, we want to be as employee friendly with this as we possibly can. Attrition when you're talking about reducing positions is your friend and uh, we're going uh, we're going to plan to to any reductions in positions tied to Esther will be done through attrition. So all these folks, because we, we do have some vacancies, all these folks will land uh, in, in, a, in a position. Um, and uh, we, the one thing that's ongoing is we are currently aligning our expenditures, uh, our budgeted expenditures to our actual costs. And we also know when we get to next year's budget that we're going to need to limit uh, the requests for new expenditures because of the, the absorbing of the, of the federal uh, programs. Next slide, please. So this is a slide uh, you saw at the last uh, uh, board budget work session. Um, this, these are updated numbers. They're very close to what we had in, in the in the uh, slide. They're just uh, uh, they're off. Uh, they're 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 more up to date, and they're the the materiality of the change is very small. So these numbers are very similar to what you saw last time. Um, so uh, as I. I believe I said last time we were on a little bit of a roller coaster ride uh, in when January 20th. We were told we were we, we, we received some information from MSDE showing that we were going to get significantly more revenue. We were very uh, pleased about that. A couple weeks later, we learned that uh, we were going to lose some of that revenue. So a little bit of the roller coaster dip. But all overall, uh, the net there's net additional state aid uh, from uh, from the state of Maryland uh, to the tune of 27. Point four million dollars, and that's good news for our budget uh, overall. Um, the these funds will be used to allow us to increase compensation beyond the step for all uh, BCPS <coughs> members of Team BCPS. The final amount uh, will be determined during our negotiations process. Um, our amended proposed FY2024 operating budget request for county funding will be reduced to twenty-three million dollars above FY. 2023, which is what I talked about on the prior slide, um, we will use 13.4 million of the additional state revenue to cover the county revenue reduction. So if you look at the three uh, little tables there, the first one is just showing uh, the net change in state aid. That's the 27.4 million additional. And then the county revenue request, the original request of 36.4 million, the reduction down to 23 uh, million. And then the important uh, little table down at the bottom shows that we are going to use that 27.4 million to one, cover the reduction in county funding uh, up to uh, for 13.4 million and then put the the remaining 14 million towards compensation so that'll help us to to move above the step that's in the in the current version of the budget next next slide please and this is actually the last slide so um, the the important thing when you're doing a budget is priorities, and we believe you know uh, we're, we're prioritizing uh, people, and we want to recruit and retain effective staff members. And in order to do that, we really need to look at um, our, our salaries and 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 freeing up as much of the dollars as we can for for, for salaries. So. Um, talked about this a little bit in the previous slides, but through collaboration with all divisions, we have identified an additional $13.5 million above the 24.8 again um, in increased efficiencies and reductions through across the board reductions to non-personnel non central office budgets. We're also uh, very much looking into aligning uh, budgeted expenditures to actual expenditures, um, and we're looking at reductions of central office positions to include supervisory uh, positions. With regards to how all the dollars are going to be used, within the, the board parameter, uh, the specified amount of, of funding that we have for negotiations, uh, we're through negotiations, we are trying to accomplish our goal is to accomplish the following items, to increase compensation for all members of Team BCPS, to provide all eligible employees with a STEP and COLA, which is a cost of living adjustment, or the equivalent uh, uh, to that. Uh, we also, a goal of ours is to implement the minimum of a $15 per hour salary uh, rate for AFSCME. Um, a big one here is uh, uh, our uh, that we're trying to accomplish is to increase the starting salary for teachers to $59,000. That would be uh, really uh, what will make us very, I believe, uh, competitive. Implement uh, the initial phase of BCPS modified enhanced 
and compressed scales for TABCO and ESPBC. So those are all things that we're trying to work with the dollars that we have to, uh, to accomplish. Um, and with that, I think that's all um, I have. Um, we, and I just, just to uh, reiterate, I think we have all the questions that we have been brought forward uh, to, to date. We have those answered and out uh, uh, available to the public. And um, we are now's the, the time to uh, pass your, uh, your approved budget request. Okay, questions? Mr. McMillian? I have a motion. So I before, move. Before you make your motion, um, <laughs> before he makes his motion, any questions about what Mr. Hartlove just shared from board members? I'm sorry, Mr. McMillian. I just want to make sure there were any questions. Okay. Thank you. I, well, I had one question about what you said. So the, the reduction of central office positions to include supervisory positions to include more supervisory or some of those positions were supervisory? No, it's, it's the, the list will have supervisory positions. This, this 13.5 13, this 13 million in additional reductions will include those types of positions. And I know we already eliminated a lot of resource teachers from CNI. Um, so are we now eliminating their supervisors as well or how will that affect we, we've had a lot of discussions about how to best uh, look at budget reductions, and we're trying to use the scalpel and, you know, and try, trying to make reductions that have the least impact on the instructional core. Um, so that's what, the, that's what our goal is with these reductions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, okay Mr. McMillian, back to you. I move that we, the Baltimore County Board of Education, fund in the 2023-24 operating budget, 24 athletic directors, one supervisor, equipment and supplies totaling $3,249,063. Is there a second to Mr. McMillian's motion? Second, Pumphrey. Any discussion? Can I speak to it? Yes. And please listen to what I'm gonna say. I readily understand this is a large sum of money. Trying not to be overly dramatic, out of the topics we discuss, this is about life and death. If we can save one life from a catastrophic accident, injury, or death, we have done our due diligence. Include this in our budget and let County Executive Osheski and the County Council decide if they're going to fund it. At least we have done our job. Thank you. Any further discussion? Dr. Hager? Um, I have two questions. Um, if we were to approve this um, this amendment to the budget above what we have, so so the the idea would be to put it on top of our existing request. Is that didn't you say that we were not allowed to do that because of the sorry the spending affordability? Yeah, that <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, no, it's not. It you know it's 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 conversations that we've had trying to stay within that. Their request is a request. So you can, you know, um, I'm not in, encouraging requests, but you can request up to, you know, whatever amount you want to request. And so if we were to move forward, um, I'm a little bit concerned about just the availability of trainers, like we, as we talked about, whether this is even a feasible thing to try to do. But again, trying to do something that is important is still worth trying to do. Um, would, do you think from a negotiation standpoint, it would, negate our ability to do the stepwise proposal that Mr. Sai suggested or? I, 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 don't, I don't believe that that's the case because what would happen, if you go down this road, we would uh, add the expenditure, we'd add the request, the, the, uh, so the request would be 3.2, we'd go up to 26.2 if, if, uh, if that's all we add. And uh, then the county executive would, would come back with questions and, you know, and one of the questions could be, is there all, or are there alternatives? I, or I, I fully support this, I don't support this, or are there are alternatives? And that would be what we, we would provide him, whatever uh, information he would need to make whatever decisions he'd want to make. And one last quick question. What Mr. Sai presented is not in the budget now. That was just an, a potential. Neither so option. That even that no. what... The smaller option isn't even in there. Neither option is in the budget okay. currently. Thank you. I, I do want to just comment. We rec re recognize the need of having these professionals available because of our students. 
um, and what we have read. So I want to I want to recognize that, but we also have recognized. You've heard um, even from public comments about, and even this board, previous board, talked about, and we support that, supporting our people in terms of the compensation. So in the ideal world, we, we would love to do both. That's why I asked the team to look at a model. Here's what the full 27, 24 um, athletic trains will look like. And here is a phase in a, as an option. We run the risk, and I just want to put that out there that Mr. Hartlove said probably in our first board's work session. When we keep adding, we run the risk that someone will either eliminate completely. Um, that's the risk that we, we take. So therefore, that's why we provided this alternative of a phase in model, knowing that there were some interests or at least questions from the board uh, from the previous work sessions. But it is, it is now going beyond the proposed budget and looking at the spending affordability uh, as a county. Um, and those are things we have to be concerned about. But we recognize these are two equally important and definitely the well-being of our students when they are on that court or field. Um, Mr. Kuhn? Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hartlove, the current funding that's paying for the contractor resources that are you know for those those other schools the um, part-time athletic trainers that funding still exists regardless of whether or not this motion passes is that correct correct okay so it's not like we're taking it out of i mean it would make sense that we wouldn't need that any longer if we got it but that funding's still there okay thank you that was my question miss harvey and i'll just oh, make sorry. a comment we go ahead we ask for what we need and then, um, you know, prioritize it and they can decide whether or not they want to fund it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Harvey? I, I just wanted some clarification. Thank you for uh, the proposal. I, I do think it's important that we make sure our, our students are safe when they're participating in athletic events. Currently, we have 10 schools who don't have an athletic trainer but they have some kind of coverage. Um, are they without any coverage? And then can you speak to how um, the schools that don't, what the difference is in the day-to-day -day, uh, execution Michael uh, Cy, um, for schools that have an athletic trainer and, and schools that don't? Here he comes. <laughs> so uh, um, as you just said, currently we have 10 schools that do not have athletic trainers. So um, what we do um, is there are certain sports that have to have medical personnel on staff at the game for the game to even start. So we make sure that we have coverage for those particular games so they can start the game so that we're not holding up the programs and so the kids can play. Outside of that, um, we try to use our other trainers to do drop-in visits. But again, um, there's enough medical issues going on at their own schools that they really don't have the time to be stretched between um, the high school, their high school and, a, and another high school. So um, we do the best that we can um, to make sure that we can get the games off. Um, we do utilize EMTs um, and to, to have them come out to games and when we have championships and stuff like that, again, to provide the safest environment. But those 10 schools are pretty much on their own outside of that. Thank you, that's helpful. Question, is it, do we ever tier requests to the county executive? Like we send the budget, but then these are our other requests for him to look at? Has that ever been done? I've heard. Last year we prioritized people, but it us. That's okay. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, last year, uh, what we did was to prioritize people at the direction of the board. So uh, as the county executive and other funders were looking, if they were making cuts, our request was that the cuts were not in compensation to staff members. But then did you tier other requests to them or no? We no. did not okay. uh, tier others. Okay. And then with the spending affordability, that means that the county executive can't even go beyond a certain number. Am I understanding that correctly? I, I don't know how, I think, 
I think that um, it's, I don't know if it's binding, like it, it, but I think it's something they very much take seriously and tr they don't even want to uh, uh, submit a budget that okay. is ab above spending affordability. Um, what is our spending authority? Do we have a number that we're looking? When you uh, spending well, the the discussions that we've had with the county and county executive is is that they didn't guarantee us, but they felt I feel like they felt more comfortable with the twenty three million dollar uh, uh, increase over last year. Um, they very much uh, w were not supportive of the thirty six point four, so they we definitely had to come down off of that. They were looking at a number of ten million uh, above. Right. Uh, uh, last year, and you know, we we we're, we're hopeful that the 23 will be supported. So, if we send beyond the 23, then we're running the risk that somebody else will say, "I'm taking X out." I might put so that's the risk that we're running if we go above the 23 million above the no no that doubt some, that somebody else can just start to. No doubt. The more you put in, the more chance of things getting redu reduced, and as much as you can give. Um, guidance and prioritization, there's no guarantee at that point it's out of your hands. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? Ms. Dominowski? I just had a question about um, AEDs and how the availability there. Is, there. is there an AED at every high school right now? Yes, there's, a, there's an AED at every single high school. We work with Health Services, uh, W. Somerville. We've, um, in light of some of the things that have happened, um, both in the county and outside the county across the country, uh, we have made it a priority to, to walk the campuses, making sure they're within the appropriate distances so that we can get to them as soon as possible uh, for our student athletes. Okay. And also, um, in light of not going over budget and as important as I think an athletic trainer in every high school and middle school is very important, um, I also think we need to find, uh, be fiscally responsible and put a committee together to find the funding to make this happen. Um, that would just be my only suggestion. Other questions, Mr. Uh, Kuhn? Thank you. I just, I, w I want to point out that the county executive <clears throat> and his staff have had lots of conversations with Mr. Hartlove, and he shared that, and that's fantastic that they work closely together. But in the report that came out, the Spending Affordability Committee report that's available online for fiscal year 2024. It's $114 million is the maximum growth in base spending. And that is to be spread out over all growth in county spending. So he has allocated us an amount based on what he wanted to allocate us on. We can ask for whatever we want, and there is money there. So let's not pretend that we can't ask for more because of this arbitrary number that he gave us. It's all about priorities. And I know there are multiple priorities for the entire county. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Mr. Side, do middle schools have eight, uh, fibrillators? Yes. Yeah. All, All 27 middle. <laughs> All 27 middle. <laughs> to the mic, Mr. Side, please. Yes, Mr. McMillian, all 27 middle um, schools have them and all 24 high schools, including uh, a detailed emergency action plan to go along with that. So we're doing the best that we can to make sure that the kids are safe. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so any other discussion on Mr. McMillian's motion? Well, Ms. Dr. Williams is your... No, I was just trying to give Mr. Sy to just, just be still. still for a minute. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sy. Right. Um, Ms. Jermillion, I think in your original motion you used the term athletic directors. No. Okay. Trainers. Okay. I'm sorry, that was told to me. Okay, so any further discussion about the motion? Okay. Um, we Yes, let's restate the motion. Mr. McMillian, can you restate your motion, please? Sure. I move that we, the Baltimore County Board of Education, fund in the 2023-24 operating budget 24 athletic trainers, one supervisor, 
equipment and supplies totaling $3,249,063. Okay, Ms. Gover, roll call vote, please. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jones? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Mrs. Um, Mr. Offerman? No. Dr. Savoy? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? No. Favor is six. Motion fails, correct? Passes. Motion passes, I'm sorry. Okay. Any other board members that have a, a motion or further discussion? Okay, let me go back to my board doc notes then. I'm sorry, I do have a motion. Okay, Ms. Pumphrey? This is on the main motion. This is, okay, yes. Um, I move to amend the fiscal year 2024 operating budget to support the provision of universal school breakfast and lunch in all Baltimore County Public Schools. Under CEP, approximately 75% of meals served to students will be fully reimbursed to the Food Service Enterprise Fund by the federal government. In order to support the implement implementation of CEP in all Baltimore County schools, this amendment will allocate an estimated two million annually with the exact amount to be determined by the budget office to fund the remaining 25% of meals that will be served but not reimbursed by the federal government. Second, Second Would you like to speak to your motion, Ms. Pumphrey? Okay, so newly released data indicates that our entire school district is now eligible to elect the community eligibility provision for, four, for a four year cycle beginning um, in the 23-24 school year. Um, apologize, I lost my note. Two thirds of all students, which is 73,000 students, now qualify for free and reduced meals in NBCPS. But there are thousands more who need food um, and are invisible in these statistics. Their families make too much money to qualify, but not enough to make ends meet. Any discussion? Questions? Yes. yes, I'm going to ask Dr. Yarborough to come to the table and provide an update about this motion. Dr. Yarborough, good evening. Good evening again. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. The update for uh, all members are we are currently working on a plan to transition to a uh, full system CEP based on the guidelines that you just mentioned as well as all of the work that we've done uh, through our enterprise funds with Ms. Hetzler as the Director of Food and Nutrition Services. And so um, essentially you don't need the motion because we're already moving in that direction because of the funds that we have available through enterprise. Okay, fantastic. Okay. And this would include 100% of bond. Absolutely. Thank you. So yes. Much. So do I need to withdraw my motion at this point? <laughs> uh, you can. Oh, well, nope, nope. Unanimous consent, yeah, to withdraw. Is so, any objection to withdrawing the motion? Can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Is that, well, that's going to affect then next year? Yes. The plan? Okay. So kind okay, of just any objection, I'm sorry. Any objection to the motion to rescind the motion? Withdraw the motion. I couldn't think of the word. Why not vote on it? <laughs> vote on Ms. Pumphrey's motion? To withdraw. Uh, is that, are you objecting to withdrawing her motion, Mr. McMillian? <laughs> are you objecting to it? Can we just have a point of clarification? And I, I just yes. asked this question, but I'm just going to ask again just to clarify. And maybe you can comment if you think I'm incorrect also. Did we just, I just want to verify that CEP will be implemented in 100% of Baltimore County Public Schools for fiscal year 23-24. For fiscal year 24, we're currently in fiscal year. Uh, yes. School sorry. year 23-24. Yes, 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 yes. yes, you are correct, and you just announced it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations, Ms. Mumphrey. <laughs> All right, so do you still wish to withdraw your 
Yes, I will withdraw my motion. Are there any objections to the withdrawal? No. Okay, hearing none, the motion is withdrawn. Okay. Any for you. other <laughs> any other motions before I okay. have a motion, Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. I'll put it in the chat. And thank you to Mr. Hartlove for providing updated language for this. I move to amend the fiscal year 2024 operating budget by restoring a total of 10 central office resource teacher FTEs at an approximate cost of 1,360,000 as follows. Advanced academics, four FTEs, English language arts, three FTEs, mathematics, two FTEs, and social studies, one FTE. The positions will be funded by reallocating planned increases in non-instructional central office expenditures to be determined by the superintendent. Is there a second to Ms. Hen's motion? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Ms. Hen, would you like to speak to your motion? I'm sure, briefly. Um, we've heard consistently from our educators how vital it is that we have resource teachers to assist them. Um, my motion restores the positions that were eliminated in this budget. Um, in addition, it adds an additional resource to the English language arts area, given that we will be rolling out new ELA curriculum. Um, and it restores some of those positions, not all. Um, my intent would be to fully restore them um, in next year's budget. However, um, I think it's reasonable to expect that we restore at least 10 for, for next year. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jones, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Um, when I first came on board, this board made a motion to remove resource teachers. Uh, so I'm glad that we're adding resource teachers. But my question really is to the people that do the work, Dr. McComas, Dr. Williams. Is this something that can be funded? Is this something you needed? Um, I'm just trying to understand because these motions are sent like five minutes before they're read. They have fiscal impacts, they have budgetary impacts and operational impacts. And uh, there's only a limited pool of money we have. So to add something, we have to take something away. And it, I don't know where that money is going to come from. So if somebody, Dr. Williams or Dr. McCombs, could explain this. Um, but I'm going to be voting no on this because I didn't get a chance to uh, to even understand this motion, which was sent a few minutes ago. Thank you. Dr. Williams, do you want um, staff to respond? or? Well, I'm looking at the motion is to restore FTEs, um, I see the motion. And again, their, their, their job is to really support schools. Um, I think we presented kind of like where we were earlier when Mr. Hartlove presented the amendments. So other than that, um, we will have to figure out if this is additional um, above the bo board's operating budget, that's one thing. If this is saying to restore and to find funds within the current budget, that means we have to do some reduction. And we're talking about people, so I'm a little nervous about the time frame at this time. If I'm understanding the motion as written. Madam Chair, may I clarify? Yes. Thank you. Um, earlier today, I sent um, a tentative motion. I was waiting for um, clarification and numbers from Mr. Hartlove, and thank you, Mr. Hartlove, for providing those. Um, he shared with me that my proposed um, reductions in other areas to fund this um, were also being considered for um, use in salary um, increases for our educators, so rather than um, including my original motion, which specified the same areas of reductions. I modified it to allow um, discretion to our team to determine where those um, funds would be sourced. So originally my motion did specify areas and I learned um, later in the, much later in the day that those were being tapped for other needs. 
So it does allow for discretion um, to that. In terms of um, what these positions are, these are current um, either vacancies or current um, currently filled positions in the current year's budget that are not included in next year's, with the exception of one FTE in ELA. Thank you. Ms. Joes, did you have a follow-up question? Yes, my follow-up question is, with all due respect to Mr. Hartlow, you're a, a budgetary person. You're not somebody that's out there in the school house like Dr. McComas, Ms. Shea, Dr. Williams, or Dr. Yarbrough, who really would be the people that I would look to for these kind of funding uh, resource allocation budget things. So I really cannot support this motion because it's irresponsible for us to vote on something without fully understanding uh, the impacts of this and how it would impact other areas in our educational system. It, it's not just resource teachers. We have very many needs. So um, I can't support this. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, I'm struggling a bit as well. I. I I do like, um, I, I think your point about the new curriculum being rolled out, you know, it makes it more important to have folks who can help train others. Is this in addition to existing positions or are we limit, does the current budget eliminate all resource, central office resource staff or is, are, are there people in house now in the current budget and this is just adding on? Can so this is, oh, no. th this is okay, to, sorry. Based on the presentation that we shared about compensation, this is to look at what we had planned to do and then restore these positions. But as I'm reading it, it's non-instructional. So there's some flexibility. Non-instructional office, central office expenditures, et cetera. So whether we can get up to $1.3 million, I'm not sure at this time. And based is, on based yeah. on what we are to save and continue to trim a little bit to then look at the compensation um, that we presented. No, and that's really helpful. Um, so are there are there currently any advanced academic resource folks? We, there are we, these these positions exist, this would be adding. One. Dr. Um, Boswell McComas. She can give you the details. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Williams. Um, so we do currently have uh, resource teachers. And in uh, putting forward a more conservative request, we, of course, would propose fewer for next year. And if I understand Ms. Hen, she, uh, to Dr. Williams' point, uh, she's asking to uh, not cut as many, if you will, in plain language, not reduce as much. Thank you. Ms. Domanowski. I just wanted to um, comment on the, on the need for resource teachers just from going um, around to different schools and these positions are needed. Um, these, I think the curriculums, um, when they're rolled out, um, they, our teachers need help implementing them and they're used. Um, I, I will support this because I've been out there and I've, I've seen, you know, especially with the advanced academics going down from what was it, six to two, or it's just, I think that we are trying to put fund our people, and these are our people, and they're helping our students, and they're helping our teachers. Um, I just want to make a comment. I desperately want more resource teachers. My worry is that $13.5 million in reductions that was, re and we're not quite, ch I'm, I don't know where those, reductions are coming from, but you had said they were central office. So I'm worried we're going in a circle. We just reduced people from central office to get us something else, and now we're going to add. Are we adding people that aren't going to have a supervisor because we've just removed their supervisor? I don't feel like I have enough info. I mean, I really want more resource help in CNI. So but my problem is I don't feel like I have the information right now to say what that 13.5 took away, and are we just making a puzzle that says that the pieces aren't going to even fit together. So I'm having. Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. I'm Hen. sorry. It's, it's not 13 million. It's 1 million. No, no, no. We, there was, in the presentation made, there was $13.5 million in more reductions made 
to allow us to do what we needed to do in some other areas. So I'm just saying that that 13.5 indicated it was central office staff. This motion is to put back central office staff. I don't know how all of that fits, to, fits together. Are we letting some people go while adding more people? So I, I'm struggling with not having all of that information to make a, a good decision. Any other questions or about the motion or discussion? Can we have a roll call, roll call vote, please? Ms. Tomanowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Dr. Savoy? Wait a minute. No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Very sad, no. Favor is five. Okay, motion fails. Okay, um, may I have a motion to approve the superintendent's proposed FY 2024 operating budget? As amended. As amended. Oh, sorry. So moved, Offerman. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Molly. Any further discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Tomanowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is 10. So the FY24 budget just passed. So thank you. And I know we've said it before, but we really have to thank staff. We, um, as a lot of new board members with a lot of questions, we really sent them fast and furious to get our understanding. So I appreciate your patience and your responses and all of the work that you've done. So thank you very much. Moving on, the next item on the agenda, we are right on time too, Whew, is the consideration of board resolution 2023-01, mental health. And for that, I call on our student member, Ms. Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Board members, at the last board meeting, the board voted to postpone this resolution to tonight's meeting. Since then, we've amended the resolution as presented to you under executive content in board docs, and I will read to you later in this statement. This resolution and mental health action is absolutely essential for our students. It is essential for our staff. My resolution speaks for itself, but I must stress to you the impact of such a resolution. In the past few years, we've experienced a crisis, but just as we've experienced trauma and this crisis, we've additionally seen a call to action. This is our call to act. I had a student share with me um, a statement on a school visit that I want to share with you before I read to you um, my resolution and the motion. Um, but he simply said, I just want us to be OK. We need help and we need support. So I move to adopt board resolution 2023-01, mental health, which states, Whereas the safety and well-being of Baltimore County Public Schools BCPS students is a high priority of the Board of Education of Baltimore County Board, as demonstrated through and in board policy, and whereas the board prioritizes school safety as integral to school climate and student success, and acknowledges that social emotional wellness is at the core of school safety and climate, and whereas quality mental health supports for BCPS students and staff are crucial in supporting young people within our school communities, many of whom navigate a plethora of complex social emotional issues, and whereas mental health is a prevalent challenge for many young people, but is often misunderstood by educators and student peers, and research from the National Alliance on Mental Health shows that one in five youth experience mental health issues, and whereas rates of mental health issues, specifically depression and youth aged 12 to 17, has drastically risen within the last 10 years according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and whereas school psychologists, social workers, counselors, 
counselors and school personnel are critical to supporting the needs of students and Baltimore County Public Schools continues to strive to meet recommended professional ratios in supporting the mental health needs of students. And whereas BCPS students and staff have experienced a unique set of challenges since the COVID-19 pandemic, for some students and staff, this experience has had an impact on mental health and has increased the importance of providing education, care, and the resources to support the ever-changing social emotional needs of students and staff. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session on the 28th day of February in the year 2023 shall direct the superintendent to establish a standing student seat on the BCPS Mental Health Advisory Council, MHAC, to elevate the presence of the student perspective and that the student representative shall be selected by the student member of the board and be it further resolved that the 2022 to 2023 three student member of the board will be tasked with establishing the public facing web page on the BCPS website communicating the work of the Mental Health Advisory Council to all stakeholders and that such web page shall be created in collaboration with the superintendent or his designee and respective staff and be it further resolved that the board through the superintendent of schools will work with the Office of Student Support Services and partner organizations to develop long-term solutions to improve to improve significantly mental health services in Baltimore County's K-12 public schools and be it further resolved that the board prioritizes and values equitable access to mental health resources for all individuals and be it further resolved that the board commits to the provision of widespread and accessible resources towards social and emotional wellness and mental health support for students and staff alike and will continue to seek opportunities to do so. It's not easy to read out loud, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, may I have a motion to adopt board resolution 2023-01 mental health as presented? So moved, Hassan. Do I have a second? Savoy. Savoy, thank you. Any discussion? Okay, may I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Congratulations, <laughs> Ms. Thank Hassan. You. And a huge thank you to Ms. Howie and Dr. Ferguson for helping me perfect this resolution. This would not be on your desks without them. So thank you to the both of them. And thank you, board, for approving this. I cannot wait to see the impact that it creates for our school system. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the blueprint for Maryland's future implementation plan. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas and Dr. Wistet. So good evening, members of the board. I'm joined this evening by Dr. Holmes and Dr. Wistead uh, to bring you an update on our blueprint for Maryland's future. Next slide, please. Our objective for this evening is to provide an update uh, on where we are with our uh, preparing for our submission uh, to the Maryland State Department of Education uh, with our implementation plan, which is due March 15th. Next slide, please. As you're aware, there are five um, major policy uh, categories in the blueprint, as you can see on the screen before you. Uh, keeping in mind that there's two fundamental goals of the blueprint. First and foremost is to ensure that our school systems across the state of Maryland are per, uh, matching and um, modeling after the highest performing school systems around the world. And second is to create a career ladder for our educators, um, which fundamentally incentivizes our best teachers staying close to the classroom and um, supporting instruction throughout their career. Uh, teachers uh, in this career layer can progress and gain more compensation, autonomy, and instructional leadership opportunities as they gain ex expertise in their field. Next slide, please. 
Um, as always, we anchor our work in our own strategic plan, the Compass, and there is natural intersection points between the Maryland Blueprint and our BCPS Compass. For example, the areas of learning accountability and results align very clearly with early childhood education and college and career pathways. Uh, another example is how high-performing workforce aligns with uh, human capital and high-quality diverse teachers and leaders section. Uh, Next, you will see in the next few slides more specific components of our blueprint implementation, uh, which align to each of our focus areas. At this point, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Holmes, who will walk us through the five pillars. Good evening. So pillar one, in Baltimore County Public Schools, pillar one focuses on early childhood instruction and the points of contact in the individuals who develop this section of our implementation plan was Dr. Wistead, Ms. Dingle, and Ms. Paula Boykin. So this section of the plan explains the expansion of high quality publicly funded pre-kindergarten, including how we will expand access to full day pre-kindergarten for tier one, three and four year olds and tier two, four year old children and implement a high quality mixed delivery public and private pre-kindergarten system. As a result of this expansion, pair educators will be added to every class, every pre-kindergarten classroom for 23-24 school year, and the contract will be coming forward with approval from you to uh, implement our new pre-kindergarten curriculum. Additionally, um, we, have, we will also, in the 23-24 school year, be adding what, 810 full-day seats. BCPS has entered into a memorandum of understanding with Maryland State Department of Education and eligible private providers participating in publicly funded pre-kindergarten in Baltimore County and other applicable government agencies. The plan outlines how MSDE requires public and private providers to meet high quality standards to receive public funding and how BCPS plans uh, to meet that high quality standard to receive public funding. Baltimore P County Public Schools administers an unbiased kindergarten readiness assessment to all incoming kindergarten students as required by legislation and will expand family supports to include the expansion of Judy Centers. Next slide, please. The next slide focuses on pillar two. Uh, the POCs are leaders in our human resource division, including Ms. Carla Simons, Ms. Liz Burquest, and our negotiator, Ms. Joelle Belisky, manager of st staff relations. So this section of the plan, the implementation of this section of the plan, uh, BCPS will recruit and support high quality and diverse teachers to meet workforce needs. This includes how we will monitor quality and diversity of state teacher candidates and existing teacher workforce, and how the state will increase the rigor of teacher preparation programs and licensure requirements revise teacher preparation programs to meet those new requirements and develop imp and implement pathways prepare for pair professionals, excuse me, to become certified teachers. The legislation also establishes new statewide educator career ladder and professional development system. BCPS will be required to implement a new program to support and encourage teachers to obtain and maintain national board certification particularly teachers from historically underrepresented populations. We will implement an educator career ladder on or before July 1, 2024. We will also encourage teachers to obtain master deg master's degrees in fields that require special expertise, have shortage areas, and enhance teachers' professional skills and qualifications so that teachers are able to teach dual enrollment courses as adjunct faculty at post-secondary institutions, including providing additional financial compensation as appropriate through collective bargaining. BCPS will implement initial 10% salary increase by June 30, 2024. 
by July 1, 2026, we must implement a minimum $60,000 starting teacher salary. Next slide, please. Pillar three. College and Career Readiness. This section is written and led by Dr. Heather Woodridge, Dr. Michael Grubbs, and Ms. Sherry Fisher, Ms. Jennifer Kraft, Ms. Kasaley Machinda, Ms. Shea, and Dr. Wisted. This part of the plan describes how BCPS will ensure students have equitable opportunities to become college and career ready and shall meet the CCR standard at an equal rate in English language arts and mathematics. BCPS must implement a fully aligned instructional system in consultation with experienced and highly effective teachers including high quality curriculum frameworks and instructional materials that build on one another in a logical sequence in English and mathematics. This includes sharing a comprehensive plan, a training and professional development plan, and the use of high quality content rich instructional materials. We're also required to keep students on track to meet CCR in English and language arts as well as mathematics. The plan shows how BCPS provides intensive intervention services to students who are not on track to become a CCR by the end of 10th grade to include progress monitoring and interventions. We must also keep students on track to meet CCR and create and implement a ninth grade student tracker system to measure progress toward on-time graduation in order to report data annually to Maryland State Department of Education. We must implement career, a college and career pathways for students by providing the CCR support pathway that allows students who are not CCR by the end of 10th grade to graduate high school CCR. This includes intervention programming and supports, individualized college and career readiness plans, ensuring each high school offers post-secondary pathways to all students who are college and career ready in grades 11 and 12 to earn early college credits and career and technical education credentials at no cost to the student's parents, including the cost of any fees. Baltimore County Public Schools has open access for all students to participate in CCBC and youth apprenticeship opportunities. We've also paid for the first AP exam for all students and continue to fund all AP exams for students who are economically disadvantaged. This includes exploring post-CCR pathways, college preparatory programs, middle and early college, dual enrollment programs, and aligning state aid funding to the cost. We must provide high quality career counseling and CTP, CTE programs by offering a robust set of C, CTE programs that allow students to earn industry recognized credentials or post-secondary certificate, or complete high school level registered apprentice programs approved by Division of Workforce Development and Adult Learning with the Maryland Department of Labor. Next slide, please. Pillar four. The points of contact for Pillar four speaks to more resources to ensure all students are successful uh, the points of contact are Ms. Melissa Forster, Ms. Michelle Stansberry, and staff from Dr. Ferguson's department, including Ms. Mrs. Patricia Mustafer, along with Mrs. Allison Myers, Dr. Aaron Sullivan, and along with Ms. Jennifer Hernandez. This portion of the plan describes how Baltimore County Public Schools will improve education of English language learners to include implementing English language workshops recommendations and increase per pupil funding for English learners. It also describes how Baltimore Public Schools will improve education for students with disabilities by using increased per pupil funding. Additionally, the law requires to provide support for students attending schools with high concentrations of students from low income household. 
personnel grants awarded to schools where at least 55% of students are eligible for free and reduced meals. Community school coordinators will be added to these schools and establish a community school and conduct a school level needs assessment in partnership with local entities and agencies. BCPS will have 56 schools in the 23-24 school year. This is a change to the slideshow that was posted, which listed 71. Principals were informed of the change made by the Maryland State Department of Education last week. This includes providing enhanced student services, employing behavioral health coordinators, and developing a plan to enhance and expand school behavioral health supports. As part of the required annual training, behavioral health coordinators and LEAs teach school staff to recognize behavioral health issues in students. The last pillar is pillar five. This is our governance and accountability section. The points of contact are Dr. Melissa Wisted and Mr. Whit Tatliff, who drafted the section of this plan, of the plan, excuse me. So this section of the plan describes how we will support the blueprint implementation planning. The AIB and MSDE will review implementation plans submitted by BCPS and will approve or disapprove plans. This section lists overall stakeholder engagement and the planning committee which drafted the implementation plan. BCPS is required to monitor blueprint outcomes and report on them to MSDE and the AIB. At this time, I'll turn the part of the presentation over to my colleague, Dr. Wistead. Thank you. The implementation plan began as a template provided by MSDE and the AIB for the LEAs to complete. Uh, so we put together a smaller implementation planning team, um, and they drafted the documents that you got to see. Uh, the staff that Dr. Holmes listed as the plan point of contact, they actually drafted each of those sections, and then we had another group of school leaders, teachers, um, and the supervisors of the principals, those executive directors, which reviewed each section of the plan. And then finally, Dr. Holmes and I reviewed um, the entire plan. So the larger uh, stakeholder group that we have with internal and external stakeholders, they um, were able to provide feedback to us when we were explaining what's in each section of the plan and what would be required. Um, and then we also had other um, small groups like BOE advisory committees and our re-engagement planning group where we received some feedback. All of these presentations are on the website. Um, and these uh, feedback sessions form the responses. So when you look at the plan, you'll see narrative responses, you'll see data charts, you'll see artifacts, um, which are supplemental things linked to the plan to support the responses that we provided. And uh, we presented this plan to the superintendent and cabinet members, and then we sent you all um, a superintendent update, which had an executive summary, and then there was a link to the full plan for your review. Uh, the, um, once we receive all the feedback back, we, ha we had a draft meeting with MSDE, and so there's a couple little tweaks that they want us to make. It was overall a very positive uh, meeting with their feedback. Um, we'll be posting the plan publicly, as well as the executive summary. The Maryland State Department of Education is saying they'll translate the plan. We sent them the languages, our top languages, and we're going to be translating the executive summary to be posted. Um, and all this will be available on the website. Next slide, please. Um, you may recall from the last time we talked, there will be two submissions of the implementation plan. The one that you're seeing now, which is due March 15th, um, you'll see that they wanted information about last year, what we did, this school year, and next school year. Um, and then there'll be a new submission next March, which will include um, school years 2024 through 2027. Um, and as Dr. Holmes stated before, we'll be monitoring the plan um, quarterly. Those people, those points of contact will be on the team to uh, ensure that the outcomes we're required to meet 
we'll have information for our data points for that. And when we get the plan back from MSDE, they'll be marking us and grading us on, you know, do our responses meet their criteria, partially meet their criteria, or does not meet the criteria. And so, um, you know, we say all this to say that the plan we post for the public may have changes to it, and then we'll repost any um, modifications that we're required to make, make with the plan. And at this time, last slide, we're here for questions or comments, and we thank you for being part of this journey for the Blueprint <laughs> for Maryland's future. So thank you for your work. I know it's a tremendous lift um, to implement all the pillars. So Ms. Harvey, you have a question? Yes, just a, a clarification. I'm looking at the list of schools in the, in the Blueprint, and it talks about uh, funding via concentration of poverty grants. What what accounted for the reduction? So um, the Maryland State Department of Education provided a list to us in January of who the um, you know, proposed schools would be. And then they had a meeting with us last week where uh, it was a new list of schools. And so the calculations that they were using um, changed. So that uh, caused a reduction in the number of schools identified for the 23-24 school year. So it's based on the fiscal calculation of what what's considered concentration of poverty? What? Correct. So, well, the fiscal is the amount that we received based on the number of schools. Um, but the calculation, and I don't know if it's still here or not, but we, we had several meetings with principals today. So the calculations that we had always used in the past and all the other LEAs used as well um, included the, uh, I'm going to say the CEP number, usually we use this direct certification number, times a 1.6 multiplier. And so they take like a three-year average of that. And um, what they did a month later was they took two of those years in that way, and then the third year they did not use the multiplier. So am I saying that correctly? <laughs> I think. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so yeah, so they just kind of they changed the formula. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Domenowski? It's not really a question, but the link in the executive blueprint where to the implementation plan is not working. So okay. just to kind of, I probably could have put that in the I chat. Think it, yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you for letting us know. We'll follow Wait, up. So I think, which one? You, here's the plan, you know, when you print it out. So <laughs> yeah. have you share mine. So yes, we can check yeah. on that. Initial comprehensive impl implementation plan. It's on page four, five. Uh, okay. The executive. That's in the board docs. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We'll work with Ms. Gover to get that link activated. I, th I thought it was an, an attachment to. Is it, is it this? Oh, okay. That's the attachment. That's the, the full plan. Yeah. But yep. Then there's another, it says there's a link. The link will take you to the. The link is it? Is it just to this? Okay, so then it's the attachment. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, uh, that was easy one. Uh, other questions? If there are no questions, I just once again must thank this team for the arduous work that they have been doing to submit this plan, and a part of the requirement is to present our blueprint knowing that there will be some changes. But I must thank Dr. Boswell McComas, Dr. Whitstead, Dr. Holmes, and all the individuals that you named, Dr. Holmes, and their and work, including our school principals. I will say this is um, like a system school improvement plan that's being developed and feedback is providing. And this is in addition um, to their other responsibilities. So I do want to acknowledge Dr. Wichstead, Dr. Holmes, Dr. Boswell, McComas. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is informational items, including 
Revised Superintendent's Rule 1300, College and Career Assessments, Financial Report for the month ending December 2022, PSA2, P PSAT 2022 Assessment Results, Second Quarter Audit Report, <coughs> Students Count 2022 Report Update, System Improvement Team Mid-Year Report 2022 to 2023, and an update on key school legislation. Um, wait a second, let me go through. Okay, we're almost there, stick with me. Um, the next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda setting. And for the first item, I will call on our chair of the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee, Ms. Hassan. Thank you. Good evening once again, board members. Today I bring for your approval our board legislative priorities for 2023 from the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee. The Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee unanimously approved these priorities. Um, I will read to you the introduction and um, simply just the titles of each of our priorities. Um, the legislative priorities are provided to you in board docs. The Board of Education of Baltimore County serves as one of the voices for public education in Baltimore County Public Schools. Unequivocally, the members of the board are committed to the academic and social emotional success and well-being of the students in Baltimore County. The priorities we have adopted reflect an equity foundation and core values, which, under, which undergird the academic, social, emotional, and economic supports necessary to give each student a rigorous education, preparing them for post high school success in a 21st century world. Our priorities outline measures which will support our students and staff to offer the best possible education. Our priorities include 11 categories, local board of education governance, education funding, facilities funding, funding and maintenance of, of effort, special education, student assessment and curriculum, student health, nutrition and fitness, student behavior and discipline, school safety and security, charter schools, and federal education funding and policy. That question. Um, do I have a motion to approve the board's legislative priorities for 2023? So moved, Pumphrey. No second is needed since the recommendations come from the committee. Discussion. Ms. Harvey, do you have a question? Uh, is there, are there particular uh, bills that are currently before the gem General Assembly that correlate to these listed priorities? So I can answer that one. Um, there are um, currently bills in the General Assembly that do um, echo um, many of our priorities. Um, we've seen bills regarding special education, um, student assessment and curriculum. Um, I've, I've actually met with um, the MABE Legislative Committee and they did go into depth on bills that they support which align with many of our priorities. Um, so those bills are existent and it is why we also include them in our legislative priorities. Follow up, Ms. Harvey? You look I'm like sorry, I'm reading the comments. Okay. There was a comment, I think. From uh, Mr. Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn, but I'm not clear that there's a list. In the information. Okay. Yes. Thank you. In information, there's a list of key school legislation if you want to see what's in front of the, the House and the Senate right now. <clears throat> it's in information. Any other questions? May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Ms. Hen? Ms. Jose? Ms. Jose? Sorry, yes. Sorry? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hem? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Okay, motion passes. Um, the next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda setting. First is committee updates. The links to the February committee meetings can be found on board docs under this agenda item. So are there any um, chairs that have an update? Um, Audit committee, Mr. Million, any updates? 
Just our next meeting is uh, Tuesday, March 21st at 4.30 p.m. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Dominowski, Budget Committee? No updates. The um, budget meeting is still set tentatively right now for March 22nd. I haven't changed it yet. Okay. Thank you. Building and contracts, Ms. Joes, any updates? Uh, no updates. The next building and contract committee will be held on uh, March, Monday, 13th at 5 p.m. Okay, thank you. Um, as far as curriculum committee, we just met this week. Um, I want to thank staff for the way they presented us information about the different um, topics. So if anybody needs more information about um, curricular topics, that PowerPoint, which is recorded, is um, included on board docs. Ms. Dr. Savoy, equity committee? Yes, good evening. Um, on Friday, February 23rd at 4 p.m., the equity uh, the equity committee virtu met virtually to discuss the disparities of hiring practices as they pertain to the hiring of teachers and administrators of color to the Baltimore County public school system. Uh, a careful review of the disaggregated data revealed that although some progress has been made since 2017, the gap is most alarming. 84% of all teaching staff are white, while only 12% are black and 4% other. Currently, there are 7,748 white teachers as opposed to 1,006 black teachers. It is suggested that Baltimore County Public Schools begin recruiting from the three area HBCU universities in Baltimore. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savoy. And I think Ms. Hassan, you already gave us your update, right? Yes, the only thing I can add is that our next um, committee meeting is on March 16th at 4 p.m. Thank you. And Policy Review Committee, Ms. Pumphrey. Yes, just our next meeting is March 20th at 4.30. Thank you. Um, next is board member agenda items. Rather than going around, I'll just ask for anybody who has a request at this time. Dr. Hager? Um, I've said this before, but I only have two meetings left, so I, hopefully, maybe. So I want to say it again. You never know. Um, so I, we've talked before about healthy school start times, and another uh, local school district just adopted healthy school start times for their students. So I would really like to hear an update. I know we've talked about um, potentially looping that into our transportation consultant and kind of understanding the cost and um, how that might happen. So I'd love to hear an update on where we are with those discussions as a school system. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have another? Ms. Domanowski? Um, I mentioned this last meeting. I want to mention it again that we get uh, the redistricting and boundary serving for the overcrowding in our schools. On, we need to start talking about that. Um, we need long-term solutions, not these short-term solutions that keep making us move our kids over and over again. And I just, I really think that's important to get on the schedule or agenda. Thank you. Mr. McMillian, did I see your hand? No. Um, Mr. Kuhn? Uh, thank you. Um, I would I would like to see uh, a facilities, basically a new construction type of an update for the board uh, on an ongoing um, repetitive timeline so that, you know, we understand where all of these projects stand because uh, we spend a significant amount of money on building new schools. Uh, we approve them at the front end, and uh, that's about it until somebody's cutting a ribbon to open a door. So there's a lot of in between there, and it would be um, great to know more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Harvey? Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to, one, make a comment and thank uh, Superintendent Williams and his team for all the work on the budget, but specifically for being responsive to what this board identified as priorities. Uh, that's greatly appreciated, and I think it will go far to improve our system and help retain uh, our staff, which we say we value, and that is a demonstrative way to, to say that. So thank you. Uh, I also would like to, at some time, add to the agenda the use of professional development staff and the allocation and the and the way in which we allocate and assign professional development staff across our school systems. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pomfrey, do you have your hand up? Okay. 
Ms. Lichter, uh, Chair Lichter, you mentioned this somewhat, but I do think that we need to work on a plan to uh, for the board to receive the budget sooner and earlier. Um, it will allow for more stakeholder input. And um, Ms. Joes mentioned that some of the motions that were brought forward today were last minute, and I think part of that is because we are working through this budget and we don't have n enough time to look at the detail and, and obtain the information that we need um, to invite motion sooner or to look at changes that need to be done um, earlier in the process. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Hen, I saw you had a item. Thank you, Madam. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like a recommendation regarding the status of Golden Ring Middle with the opening of the new Northeast Middle School and the expansion of Pine Grove Middle School. That has not come to the board. Um, the board has requested status updates on Golden Ring Middle. It's currently um, slotted for um, repurposing. I'm not sure what that means, but the board needs to approve any action that is taken regarding Golden Ring Middle. So that needs to come to the board on a future agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. All right, wait a second. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board will hold a public hearing on the Deer Park Middle Magnet School Capacity Relief Boundary Study tomorrow, March 1st at 6.30 at Newtown High School in the auditorium. Sign up for speakers will begin at 5.30 p.m. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 14th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for everybody who's done everything for us this evening, and thank you for joining. The meeting at 9.34 is now adjourned. <laughs>